It's time for Declare Your Independence with Ernest Hancock. Believe me when I say we have a difficult time ahead of us. But if we are to be prepared for it, we must first shed our fear of it. I stand here without fear because I remember. I remember that I am here not because of the path that lies before me, but because of the path that lies behind me. I remember that for 100 years we have fought these machines. And after a century of war, I remember that which matters most. We are still here! Let us make them remember. We are not afraid! No fear, no fear, no fear, no fear, no fear, no fear here on Declare Your Independence with me, Ernest Hancock. Roger Veer, Roger Veer, Roger Veer, Roger Veer, Bitcoin.com. And uh, his new one is Hijacking Bitcoin.com, uh, the book, We're ready to be the movie. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. I didn't even think of that. Is that, Roger, is that something that would uh, get marketed to make uh, the movie? Is that a thing? It, it could be possible, and stranger uh, or less strange tales have been told, so this certainly could make a good movie with all the crazy uh, things that happen. Oh, uh, it's uh, definitely, you know, at least a documentary. You know, Roger Veer, he started off, um, when I had first heard about him, uh, it was on Free Talk Live, and, uh, you know, Ian Freeman, Mark Edge, out of the New, uh, Free State Project in New Hampshire, had a show, and they were, uh, and, and we still broadcast on their uh, network and they were pimping this new thing called Bitcoin. It's about 2009, I think it was. And, you know, 9, 10, 11, you, you got involved with it, but it, they really hit the libertarians hard, wanting to make sure that we all knew about it. And it was so important that to us, because we understood it was people money. You know, we all the thing we really starting to push silver at the time. We knew that the Federal Reserve was going to go. It's 08, the Ron Paul Lovelution. He's it's in the Fed, and never, we we got it. Okay, so we were easy sell, and so was Roger. But he came at it from a different perspective. He had already had an online business, and what was it called? It was uh, Memory Dealers, and then you had a you know Agile Star or Agile Star or however you call that. And it, what he did is he sold components, <coughs> computer components and different things on there. And he took Bitcoin. He started taking Bitcoin. He's like, yeah, you know what you can buy with Bitcoin? You can buy my stuff. That way I get your Bitcoin. Thank you for playing. So this was a, uh, he understood from the beginning, you know, how strong this was going to be. Now, as time went on, he started to invest. That's what they call him, Bitcoin Jesus. He was there with the money. He was an angel, man. He had the money because he understood the infrastructure needed to be done. I understood that you had to spend it. You know, I, I wish I had all the Bitcoin. I got 40000 No, God, now was it? $70,000 hoodies in my, you know, closet. So this is a, um, a great story, but it almost from the very beginning, when I was doing interviews and so on, from the very beginning, there were people that understood it at a philosophical level, and there were people that were just trying to shoehorn it into the legacy banking system and whose butt they got to kiss and how can they make it go up more and make a bunch of money. It was it was not a philosophical thing for them. It was just another resource to be exploited in however way they could do it, and now they turn Bitcoin into paper with ETFs like they did gold and silver. I mean, this is the way it is. So to me, it got I see what it's going to be. Goldman sucks not govcoin. I I already see this coming. But Roger was the one out there, and there are a couple of others, but I mean the most consistent understood what it meant, why to humanity was Roger. And we'll probably talk about some of these other efforts here that helped launch it. But um we're gonna be talking about hijacking Bitcoin, how and when it went bad. And from my perspective, as I interviewed people, and Roger quite a, fit, quite a bit too, there's a human element. And people wanted to control it. And I'm hoping 
as Roger explains the book and his motivations for writing it and some of the highlights in it, that, you know, they're, they're all covered. I'm sure they are. Because we don't get the book is not out until when, Roger? Uh, it's on pre-sale right now, so you can pre-order it. Uh, but it'll actually be delivered on uh, April 5th, so just a few days from now. A few days from now. Okay. So let's get into it. Now, Roger, I really enjoy talking to you because I think we're kind of understand on the same wavelength here. From that perspective, I wanted to show people, so I got this page up. There's one of your... Uh, sites that oh, I think it's, maybe it's over on Bitcoin, uh, uh, you know, featuring your pretty face on there, that you represented an encouragement for people to read about six books. And I was looking up there, it's Murray Rothbard, you know, it's um, uh, uh, The Law by Bastiat, it's, um, uh, you know, that kind of economics and one letter, Hazlitt stuff, I mean, whatever it is, it's all the, the, they're traditional ones for people to understand political philosophy, proper rule of government, and money. Why those books? Go ahead and explain that and a little bit about your philosophy going into this, and then we'll get into the book. Yeah, th those books were the things that influenced me and, and gave me the understanding of Bitcoin to appreciate it so early on. And if it hadn't been for reading those books, I wouldn't have appreciated Bitcoin as early on. And so like, you have to understand money and you have to understand how something becomes used as money to understand why Bitcoin was going to be used as money. And that's why Satoshi intended it for it to be used as money right from day one. And so it's really interesting. Like you always hear like the people that are actually up to no good accusing the good guys of doing the, the exact same thing that the bad guys are actually doing. And so we're hearing people say, oh, I was the one who tried to hijack Bitcoin. Well, no, 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 no. We put all the details right there in the book of exactly who tried to hijack Bitcoin and how they did it and citations, you know, for every step of the way. And so it's really fantastic that the truth is finally going to get out there in this book. But uh, here's some of the books that definitely had a huge, huge, huge impact on me. Of course, Frederick Bastiat's The Law, Everything by Murray Rothbard Will Change Your Life, uh, Lysander Spooner, another, you know, just great, great, amazing figure in American history that they never teach you about in the mandatory right. youth propaganda camps that people commonly call government schools or public schools. And of course, you know, Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. I'm so glad you you pulled this up. This is, so you know, taking a, a stroll down memory lane for me here as well. Uh, this is really uh, books that will change your entire view of the world. And then the singularity is near. Well, man, if you're following the AI stuff, like it, it's hard to know how it's going to play out. But the singularity really is getting to be uh, near at this point with the chat GDP and everything else. So uh, who knows what's going to happen with that. But I oh. guarantee you the AI is going to be opening bank accounts with Bank of America. They're going to be using cryptocurrency to do whatever they're up to. All right, man. I We can go down so many tangents, but you brought up AI. You said it, okay? The... Um... I've been paying attention to that quite a bit, too. The one thing that I don't think people uh, are given a lot of attention to is the dojo chip that Tesla's doing. They're doing, they got robots on wheels, got millions of them. I mean, they're just running around all over, getting all this visual data and uh, learning from that. But um, it's the hardware. It's the chip. It's the capacity. I also, just last night, I saw... An, uh, NVIDIA, the NVIDIA, the, how you say that? The uh, NVIDIA, yeah. I'm sorry? NVIDIA. NVIDIA, yeah, is, uh, thank you. One the, of the hardware manufacturers for all of that stuff. Well, they uh, have a chip on top of a chip, ganged in a chip, 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 chip. They did a presentation of, and we're getting into, I can't even, I don't even know what they do, gazette, gazillion ediflops. I mean, whatever the heck that they're doing. And it is within just a few years, they're, the Moore's Law thing is, you know, it doubles, what, every eight years, something like that. And they're blazing past that. You know, you got to the point where you thought computation was not going to, you know, be a thing. It's a thing. So I am seeing AI, and they're going to have to have some kind of an AI currency that you have incentives that are going to be put out. And they're, once you program any kind of financial incentive, AI is going to use what? Crypto. You know, hell, they'll make their own. They'll be, you know, blip, we got our own crypto, and you won't even know they're even doing it. You know, I mean, we that is a, a dangerous thing. And when they keep going on about existential threat AI, the one explanation that I heard that uh, will apply here is that the reason it's so dangerous is because it can make the most persuasive argument down to every individual. It's not, 
you know, all black people, all gay people, all men, all women. I No, it's down to the individual. What is the most persuasive argument for anything to you? And the motivation behind making that argument is who? What state? What king? What, you know, Putin, you know, Biden? I mean, you know, in a war of, I mean, it's just going to get craziness. So I remember when there was a Texas Bitcoin thing, you know, Snow had done, where they had a hacking uh, competition at a Bitcoin conference. And the one that they were most interested in was using the power of Bitcoin, the mesh network and the nodes and all that, saying, you know, we could turn this into a prediction model for stock or artificial intelligence. Or what. Boom, they were swarming all over that. In the space, do you know anything about um, how Bitcoin inspired some AI or it's got its own track? And one of the more interesting related concepts that people were making arguments early on that Bitcoin is one of the very first artificial life forms. And Bitcoin is actually the one controlling all us people to set up the nodes and help it spread. And like it's consuming all this electricity and replicating with nodes all over the world. And like it's an interesting argument. So uh, another fun argument that they made earlier on is that uh, someday when humans finally come in contact with aliens, we don't have to be embarrassed about the type of money we're using anymore because now we have huh. Bitcoin. Whereas if you think about little round pieces of metal or pieces of paper, that is pretty embarrassing technology uh, compared to Bitcoin. So there's there's a lot of different ways in which this can change the world. Um, when did it start going bad? You know, how early for you? For me, it was pretty early. I was asking a lot of questions, and it just came down to development team. I go, well, there's always a human element then. Then somebody's going to go to that development team, and we want to be in control of the development team. I mean, that is pretty obvious to me from the beginning. But, you know, the slogan is, what is it? Trust in math, bear, what is the Trust not verify, I think it's the, the slogan of a lot of Bitcoiners there. But uh, but it was on the radar of, you know, the powers that be right there from the earliest days. So I, I first heard about it on Free Talk Live, as you mentioned, uh, thanks to Ian Freeman, who unfortunately now is in federal prison uh, for running Bitcoin ATMs without permission from people that he's never met, uh, that he's never met. So it's really a, a sad state of affairs. So uh, free Ian Freeman, like that guy's a real American hero. And just uh, like most real American heroes, they wind up uh, going to jail at some point in their life. And, yeah, he uh, didn't really, really take really the plea. He's like, nope, do it. We're going all the way through. So props to Ian. Um, yeah, you heard about it. And what sparked it? What was it was said? Was it a series of shows immediately? Start there. Tell us what in, in, in rapture, you know, you with this. I mean, what was it? So Ian Freeman mentioned it in reference to the Silk Road, where people were buying and selling illegal drugs using Bitcoin. And I've never bought or sold or used any sort of illegal drugs ever in my entire life, although I think that those should be completely illegal. But it occurred to me, like, what the heck kind of money are people using for this, right? You can't do that with PayPal. You can't do that with your bank account. What are they using for this? So I started looking into Bitcoin. And then I realized, oh, my goodness, this is going to change absolutely everything because I've been running an e-commerce website for, I don't know, like a decade or so at that point. And every single day, people with stolen credit cards were trying to buy things from my website. And it was a really big headache to figure out which orders were real and which ones weren't. But with Bitcoin, there were no chargebacks. I could accept payments from anyone anywhere in the world instantly. And there was no, there was no risk, right? So this is a merchant's dream come true. And it was a dream come true for people internationally that wanted to buy things from other people too, because like it made it so much easier than a credit card or a wire transfer to get involved. But uh, that was in you know 2010, I heard of it. And then it was in late 2010 or early 2011, the CIA was already interested in this, and they called the lead developer at the time, Gavin Andreessen, uh, who's the one who told Mark uh, and uh, Ian Freeman over at Free Talk Live about Bitcoin. But they called him in to give a presentation to the CIA about Bitcoin and how it worked and this and that. And, you know, who knows? The CIA is pretty sneaky. Maybe they invited him to give a presentation just to figure out what the general public had already figured out about Bitcoin and maybe to hide their tracks that they were already involved in doing stuff with it. I, who knows? But then in 2011, June, when Bitcoin reached $30 for the first time ever, and it did it very quickly from, you know, two or $3 to $30 in like two weeks. And for the first time ever, Bitcoin got some worldwide media attention. It was in you know news articles around the world and started to get some attention for the first time. And way back in June of 2011, the main discussion forums where people were talking about it became overrun by bots that intentionally shut down the discussion that people were trying to have about Bitcoin. So the first time in the world Bitcoin ever got any attention 
it was already on the radar of, of, of somebody that didn't want people to be able to talk about it and didn't want people to be able to hear about it. And they literally just flooded the, sport, uh, the forum with spam so that when lots of new people were interested in Bitcoin for the first time, they couldn't get any information about it. All they could get was spam. So that just shows how early the disruption of Bitcoin was already uh, you know, being perpetrated by these people. Well, you think these people had something to do with its creation? Let's talk about that a little bit. You know, we were never, oh, Satoshi Nakamoto, we know him, we don't know him, we'd have to do him. I don't think any of us really cared. That wasn't the point, you know. Um, what was your thought on that? Did you care who did it, or did you suspect that it might have been a, a state action or they, them, those or something? What do you think? Yeah, I, I didn't really care much at all. Like, I guess I'm appreciative to Steve Jobs for making an iPhone at some point, but I doubt he had very much of anything to do with the creation of this one, and he's been gone uh, for a while. And I'm glad I get to use it. I'm thankful, you know, the invisible hand of the market, all these people collaborate together to build these amazing things. But, you know, anything from a, a cell phone to, you know, so the vitamins on my desk and whatever else, like people don't put much time or thought into it. They just take it for granted. And Bitcoin's kind of the same way. It just worked for people early on and solved a problem. So people just naturally wanted to start using it. And uh, it didn't matter who the creator was. People just wanted to use it. But uh, I guess it does matter at this point who the disruptor was because it intentionally was disrupted by a number of people. And we gave all the details right there in hijackingbitcoin.com. It'll really make everybody's jaw drop that reads this when they realize, wow, this happened to Bitcoin. This went on. This amazing tool for the world was disrupted and neutered. And, and you know, basically they had this amazing tool stripped away from the world and, and turned into something not nearly as useful. And it's really a disappointing and sad to see that happen. But it's good that the story is being able to, to finally be told uh, in, in full right there. And uh, again, please, uh, if, if you're not aware of this, or even if you think you're aware of it, go and buy that book at hijackingbitcoin.com. I guarantee you, you'll learn lots of new things that you weren't aware of uh, previously. And okay. Really you, uh, Tease these guys. I, I, I'm, yeah, get it. Because there's a lot of, lot of stories. Just one that tell them the Decastries link. You know, just give that little story right there and, you know, I'll tell you everything. <laughs> Yeah, I, coincidence or not, uh, the main people that were funding, uh, the main entity that was busy disrupting Bitcoin's usefulness for currency, I it's literally like it was you know the, the head of the Bilderberger Group, and like, I don't know, put on your conspiracy theory hat. Like, there's plenty of you know smoke going around about those guys. It does. It's something that certainly makes you go hmm. But even without going there, there's plenty of absolutely open, indisputable, like uh, direct evidence. There's a man that claims to work for a U.S. intelligence agency literally was funding to make Bitcoin less useful for payments and funding propaganda to attack Bitcoin uh, and its ability for people to be able to use, uh, be used as cash around the world. So, and everything's, you know, there's citations and sources for every last little detail in the book. Uh, I think there's something like 300 citations or something. And it's a huge number uh, there. And uh, the, the, the powers that be are going to be really upset. This information is getting out, but uh, that's the neat part about, you know, publishing in the internet, that sort of thing is now if, it can be delayed, but eventually the truth gets out. Right. Well, why now? You know, why, why not five years ago? Why not? You know, th this book should have been written a bunch of times for a bunch of reasons. Why now? Yeah, it, to be honest, it would have been out about a year earlier, but I, I ran into some other issues in my personal life that I had to deal with for about the last year. And uh, it just kind of worked out well that the timing came out now with a bunch of other stuff happening. And, and crypto is hot on everybody's mind. Oh, no, moment. it's hot but, now. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah. You know. This is, you know, just to skip to the, I want to talk about a bunch of other things, but um, the DeCastries thing, when you see that they were trying to destroy Bitcoin, they wanted the transactions fee fees really high. And we'll talk about the, the fork with Bitcoin Cash, you know, after I make this statement. But the, um, it was, why are they doing that? Why are they keeping the memory pooled down? You know, whatever we'll talk about, but. It was it was like they intentionally wanted to kind of shoehorn Bitcoin into the legacy banking system by having off chain different networks. And you might as well just call it Bank of America versus Chase or something. It was you could see it happening. Then you see that, you know, core development, the people are actually working on it. Then you have to have and we'll talk about how changes are made and accepted by miners. You know, it, it's self-regulating. You know, every two weeks it resets a difficulty to make it to where the average block is 10 minutes. It was very ingenious and simple. I mean, I'm sure it's complicated, but, you know, the concept was simple that made Bitcoin work and it do it on its own. It wasn't some central command. It was math. Well, 
what happened, all of a sudden you find that there is a group, and I can't remember their name, Bit Shares, Bit Something, Bit Somebody, you know. Blockstream. Blockstream, Blockstream, that's right, Blockstream. So Blockstream comes in, and you scratch the paint, and you go, well, who's behind this? Some, you know, gazillion air insurance uh, firms in France, Europe of whatever the heck, and he was chairman of two Bilderbergers, and I'm going, well, we're done, you know? So this is, when you have that kind of stuff just right there in your face, you got to go, what the, and who's the hero of this story? Roger Veer. That was coming out and go, man, they are doing it wrong and on purpose. Why? So did you ever really find out why, or you just didn't care, and then you can tell us about Bitcoin Cash? Yeah, well, there were probably multiple players with multiple reasons, but the most simple, clear, not even hidden reason there for Blockstream to want to block the stream of uh, Bitcoin was that they literally made the transactions of Bitcoin slow, expensive, and unreliable. And they said, oh, we have this other product called Liquid. You should use Liquid instead of Bitcoin. And if you use Liquid, your transactions will be fast, cheap, and reliable. Never mind the fact that it's centralized and your transactions can be censored and all the fees that you'll pay to use Liquid go to us, the Blockstream guys, don't pay any attention to that, but look, Bitcoin doesn't work very well, so you should use Blo uh, Blockstream's liquid product instead. And in fact, just kind of by chance, I don't think uh, Adam Back, the CEO of Blockstream, knew it, but like on the day the book got released, he sent me an email, maybe a few hours before the book got released, saying, hey, Roger, you should come back to Bitcoin and help us promote liquid. And it's like, ah. you've missed the entire point of peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. And this guy, it'd be like somebody that went around with a with a you know sledgehammer breaking people's legs and say, hey... I have a factory that sells crutches. You should buy crutches for me. And if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be able to walk. But don't pay attention to the fact that I'm the one who broke your legs to begin with in the first place. And that's exactly what they did to Bitcoin. They broke Bitcoin's usefulness for payments. And now they're trying to sell people a product to fix the problem that they caused. And lo and behold, they earn money from every single person that uses the product that they're selling. And it's just uh, really frustrating that more people haven't noticed that yet. But uh, hopefully this book will, will point that out to a whole lot more people. And it's uh, really kind that 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 word gets out because most people don't realize that these people intentionally hijacked Bitcoin to break it and make it less useful and to get people to use their, their alternative products in which they make money for every single person uh, that makes a transaction. on These it. people describe that these people. Yeah. Blockstream. Uh, so there's a bunch of different people there. The CEO is a man named Adam back. Uh, the CTO for a while was a guy named uh, Greg Maxwell. I think he's since moved on. The chief strategy officer is this, uh, really toxic individual named Samson Mao, who uh, years and years ago, Gavin Andreessen, literally the person that told, that told the Free Talk Live guys about Bitcoin, said, hey, this guy's toxic, like we shouldn't pay attention to him. And so like, it's really interesting how many people out there are just get brainwashed, right? If you hear the wrong message often enough, loud enough on enough platforms, you'll start to believe it. And propaganda really, really works. And that's why these people also had to engage in massive, massive censorship campaign to fool the world about what Bitcoin was supposed to be about and uh, and how it was supposed to be used and, and what was really happening with that. But luckily, this book is uh, setting the record straight. Okay. I want, I want to, for the audience to understand the, the players in this, there were a lot of people, such as yourself, that understood this philosophically and how it really was going to have a big impact. And they go on to different things using different cryptos or their whatever. You know, hopefully, philosophically, they you know, stay in tune. But um, what was the philosophy that as you do this over time, you start to gather around you friends and accomplices on doing, you know, the freeing the planet with people money and the other side, you know, define the break. What's the difference? You know, is it a character thing? Is it upbringing? Was it family, parents, incentives, threats, uh, uh, you know, freaking everybody, anarchist libertarian were on one side and everybody else the other i mean you know explain to me where you think the line is yeah and they were certainly aligned with like the you know libertarians and anarchists on the you know peer-to-peer -peer cash side and then the people that were more you know tolerant of statism on the other side but i think uh one of my favorite uh, twitter accounts sal the aggregate summed it up very uh, very very well he said bitcoin isn't a, a get rich quick scheme it's a get free quick scheme, right? There it's supposed to empower individuals all around the world. And if you succeed in that, you also get rich at the same time. It's actually both, but a, a big portion of the world just seems to be focused on, <laughs> oh, the number goes up, 
Don't worry about the usefulness. Don't worry about the you know self sovereign uh, control of your Bitcoin. Just you know buy it, and the number will go up. And you know never mind the fact that uh, you know the the main spokesperson for Bitcoin at this point is probably this guy named Michael Saylor, who's out there publicly telling people don't replace the dollar, don't replace the euro, pay your taxes, don't be mad at the government. Like what happened to Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin was supposed to be, you know, punk rock libertarian grassroots movement of empower yourself to have complete control over your money and, and tell the man, hey, leave me alone. I don't need your dollars anymore. I have Bitcoin. And now it's the exact opposite where they're telling people, oh, put it in your 401k and obey everything the government tells you to do. And you're not allowed to, have, you know, self-custody wallets to make payments and this and that. It's really disgusting how the entire, uh, the entire philosophy of Bitcoin has been turned upside down at this point. And the people that hijacked Bitcoin mock and attack the people that actually want Bitcoin to have the, the original vision that it had, which was peer to peer electronic cash for everybody worldwide right now with fast, cheap, reliable payments for everybody without having to use Adam back and Blockstream's uh, liquid network where they charge you a fee uh, and they earn the fee on every transaction that you make. You know, these names, we start slinging names around. I, you know, I remember these people and different rules that they had. But um, you were not really a coder, a programmer. You know, you weren't one of the guys back there, you know, banging on the keyboard, creating a new whatever. It was a philosophical thing with you. Who was it around you that could technically do or explain? I mean, you have Bitcoin.com. I mean, holy crap. You know, they want they probably offered you some money for that. But, you know, I'm you have. These people around you, who are they? What's their level of understanding? Yeah, I, some of the most technical people in the entire space were on the big block Bitcoin Cash side. In fact, uh, 2019-ish maybe or something like that, one of the Bitcoin Cash uh, developers literally found a bug in what's called Bitcoin today in BTC that would allow infinite inflation. And if you have infinite inflation, that's kind of the end of Bitcoin. So he literally discovered a bug that would have been the end of Bitcoin and rather than exploiting it and using it, you know, as a weapon to, to you know, in the battle that, you know, the, for mind share between Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin, he told them very quietly, said, hey, there's this bug, you guys should probably fix it. And then they fixed it. And the really interesting part about it, too, is uh, the same guy that introduced the bug was the same guy that was going and complaining to, I believe, the SEC, asking them to prosecute Bitcoin Cash and make Bitcoin Cash illegal. So as status to status can get, a guy named uh, Matt Carr, oh, uh, Matt I think uh, Blue Matt is his screen name. San Francisco guy with blue hair um, introduced that infinite inflation bug. And the guy that discovered the bug, he said, you know, you can't prove it, but he really, really has to wonder if it wasn't in implemented intentionally. Like if the bug wasn't introduced intentionally in a way to like potentially destroy all the Bitcoin. And like, that's, you know, that's a big conspiracy theory, but like, that's literally Nothing the guy that discovered the bug. Me. About. And nothing yeah nothing should surprise you and they're willing to kill people around the world with drone strikes and they have you know the CI makes all sorts of secret assassination tools why wouldn't they do a little bit of you know software sabotage to uh, disrupt something that has the ability to disrupt the US dollar as the world reserve currency like it would be you'd be stupid to think that they wouldn't try something like that and so like did this guy blue mat actually do it on purpose I don't know but it certainly certainly makes me uh, suspicious so this is the incentive to uh, control Bitcoin or destroy it, one or the other, is so high. Why? Because it disrupts the entire power structure in the entire world, right? Like this is literally one of the most world-changing technologies to come around in a long, no, long time. Okay, I, I understand that, but you say it's world-changing. I mean, I, I need a word picture. I need a description because I, I, I'm with you. I understand. You know, it is global world freaking universal oh my god changing stuff what did it really and the solve reason why, yeah the reason why is that right now the u.s dollar is the world reserve currency right if someone in japan wants to do business with someone in china they're probably going to use the dollar for the payments right and the u.s dollar has been the world reserve currency for coming up on a you know coming up on 100 years now uh if that's about to change, the U.S. government's going to be terrified because what are they going to do? How are they going to control everybody? How are they going to like you know rule the entire world? How are they going to print trillions of dollars and do whatever they want with it and spend it on all these things if people aren't using dollars anymore? Bitcoin had a real shot at displacing the dollar and the euro and the yen and everything else and becoming the, the money for the entire world. That's much, 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 much less likely now with the way that they've managed to, to neuter uh, Bitcoin. And so, of course, that's why they were busy trying to disrupt Bitcoin because it would change the entire power structure of the entire world. And that's that's something that the existing power holders wouldn't want to have happen. Early on, we had our freedom summits. We even had a Bitcoin summit. 
I've gone to many, you know, uh, conferences and seminars and uh, uh, events and so on and talked to a lot of people. It was obvious to me that there were a lot of group people that wanted to promote Bitcoin, not for the freedom aspect, but for we're going to make us some money. OK, which is fine. You know, do that freedom thing and you make all the money you want. But their focus was to get it shoehorned into the legacy banking system. And then here come the ETFs. This ETF stock market future trade kind of give your opinion on that of what that does. Beneficial, not, you know, ignored, don't ignore. I want to know what your thought process is on them putting Bitcoin on an ETF. And we've seen them already manipulate the price of gold and silver with these ETFs, right? Where like, who knows if there's, you know, how much gold is actually backing up the paper gold or the paper silver. They're going to do the exact same thing with cryptocurrencies, right? They're going to have fractional reserve Bitcoining, just like they have fractional reserve everything else already. And so like, that's what's so frustrating. Is, and one of the beautiful parts about Bitcoin and today Bitcoin Cash is that people can hold the funds themselves. If you can hold the funds yourself, you're at far less, you know, susceptible to the manipulation. You're still somewhat, you know, vulnerable, but at least you have the money yourself and you're not going to wind up being, you know, holding nothing at the end of the day. And uh, they've really done it a, a good job in a bad way of making Bitcoin not easy for people to, to custody themselves and be in control of their money themselves. And so like, Really, really frustrating to see it happen with you know gold and silver in the past, and you know now they're doing the same game uh, with uh, with with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as well. You saw this coming early on. You could see, and I remember uh, you describing the problems. Why are they doing this? This is not going. You're not going to have it to where it's going to be capable of rivaling credit cards. You can't do enough transactions per second. You have uh, it was on purpose. They wanted to raise the transaction transaction fees. Oh, you want that uh, payment to go through? Yeah, pay a little extra something, something to the home team here, and then maybe we'll you know put you in line. Or you have to wait forever. Or there are as much as sixty dollar transaction fees. I paid thirty six dollars one time because I I had a a um, uh, paper wallet that you know I had I used as a demonstration on the show and I just had it sitting by my studio desk, you know, in my home years ago. And I just uh, wave it around and this does this, and this is how it works. And do my son was over on Christmas day and he wanted to uh, take my, you know, I had a off line machine that I uh, print out and offline printer. You got to get all geeky about it, you know, to make, um, uh, cash wallets, you know, audio paper wallets. Well, he was doing that for all the cousins, all his nieces and nephews and kids. And he gave out, you know, some Bitcoin to everybody. And he did it like I forgot about that. I got to check, make sure those kids got those. There's always you get those calls. <laughs> Is there a Bitcoin customer service? I lost my whatever. you know. So what happened was he was sitting there making them and he saw that over there. And he took his phone and he went security violation, bloop. And he scanned the, the private key and he took it. And I'm going, you son of a but And. But it was like $45 on it because it was like a dollar, you know, long time before that. And it had a $36, I wrote on it, a $36 transaction fee. He got like 4 or $5. And I go, well, if that isn't a knee, so I use it as an example for that. The transaction fees got so high, it was unusable. When I have some guests on, you know, one, you know, and he go, well, what do you want, Ernie, bubblegum money? Yes, I do. That's exactly what we were promised that, you know, it costs like nothing, fractions of a penny. Whatever. I can't believe how many Bitcoin I was just giving away all the time. But the thing was, is that that feature started to go away. And when it did, it was intentional. You were there. You were hammering. I want to talk about that time period when you were making it clear what was going to happen and it happening. And then the fork of Bitcoin cash. Bring us back to that time, and before you actually did it, you were there. You were trying to work with them. You were trying to stay in Bitcoin. You were trying to make sure they made good decisions. They wouldn't. You took Bitcoin and fulfilled the promise because I Bitcoin Cash works. It freaking works. When everything else is like a gazillion dollars and they're doing kind of, yeah whatever. I took all my Bitcoin, but one Casatius coin I got for, you know, it's, it's going by me. 
you know, backhoe here directly is what's going to happen. But, you know, what I'm looking at is the usefulness of it. And it became unusable for what I wanted to do. So I took all that, goes into Bitcoin Cash, which goes up and down and up and down, does its own thing. The future of Bitcoin Cash, because it's Bitcoin, it is Bitcoin, that works. So I'm telling you, you got a Bitcoin that works, that will rise up. So bring us back to that time when you made that decision to support the fork and what bled up to that. And monologue me, man, I want to hear the whole story. Yeah, a lot of places on the internet say that I created Bitcoin Cash, but the fact of the matter is I had nothing to do with the creation of Bitcoin Cash. I was still busy on what's called Bitcoin today. And it was supposed to scale, it was supposed to scale, and they were making promises about this and promises about that. And one of the, you know, and a string of broken promises, but the final broken promise that broke the, you know, the camel's back of me wanting to be involved in Bitcoin was this thing called Segwit2x, where they were supposed to implement segregated witness, this technical thing called segregated witness on Bitcoin, and it doubled the base block size from one megabyte to two megabytes, which would, both those things together would more than double the capacity of Bitcoin and buy us, you know, maybe another couple of years of, of adoption, and then you can figure out what to do there, whether or not they got the Lightning Network working or something else that buy us more time. Anyhow, somehow they decided that they would do the segregated witness part first. And then when it came time to you know keep the other half of the bargain, which was the two megabyte block size increase, they reneged and they canceled the whole thing. And Bitcoin Cash had already been around for, for months at that point, maybe, I don't know, six months or something. Um, and that was the point where I said, okay, Bitcoin doesn't have a chance of being money for the world at this point. If they're limiting the block size to one megabyte, that's retarded, right? Like I've been, I'm, I was old enough already at that point. And I'm even older now. Like computers are getting better and faster and yeah. cheaper and the internet's getting better and faster and cheaper. And that's literally what I was doing before Bitcoin is I was selling the hardware that enabled, you know, all your home internet connections and, and everything else there. And so I watched the bandwidth speeds just get faster and faster and faster and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So anyhow, when they broke that promise, I looked around at all the other coins out there and thought, okay, which one of these has the best chance of becoming the peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash for the world that can empower individuals to have control over their own money? And there were a number of contenders out there. There was uh, Ethereum was you know getting started. Monero was already out there. Bitcoin Cash was already out there. And I looked at all of them and I decided, okay, Bitcoin Cash is probably the one that has the best shot at, uh, at doing that. And I already own Bitcoin.com as well. So I felt like that was a really good match as well. And so I started focusing on Bitcoin Cash. And today, you know, it's one of the top cryptocurrencies in the world. It just plains work, just plain works. And if we can go back to that example with the paper wallets you had, you said there's, let's say there was $50 on the one and your your nephew or whoever scanned it and took it off and it was a $36 fee. So that means there was $14 left that he claimed if there was $50, but that $14 that he received would then cost another $36 to spend. So the $14 he received isn't even worth anything at that point. Right. And it was $50 was the average transaction fee at the end of 2017. That was the average fee. If you're running in any sort of business where you're receiving multiple payments from customers, Per incoming payment, it's going to cost you fifty dollars to go out. So if you got twenty payments from you know twenty different customers, it's going to cost more than a thousand dollars to send that money back out. And so myself running a business more times than I can count, I had to spend over a thousand dollars for a single transaction uh, fee, and that was it. I I'd had it with Bitcoin. I was done at that point. I looked for a cryptocurrency that would actually work, and I didn't need a custodian and didn't need permission from somebody, and wouldn't cost you know fifty dollars or a thousand dollars one day to use, and then you know cost something less the next day. But the part that really pushed my buttons and, and the world still doesn't seem to have realized is that the software engineers that hijacked the Bitcoin product, they openly say, if you listen to what they're saying, they want the transactions on Bitcoin to be slow. They want the transactions to be expensive and they want the transactions to be unreliable. And like most people still don't realize that to this very day, like they openly say, if you listen to what they're saying, they want the transactions to be slow, expensive and unreliable. Well, I have news for you. If something's slow, expensive, and unreliable, people are going to look for something else. They're going to use something else. If your car is slow, expensive, and unreliable, you're going to look for a, a fast, reliable, inexpensive car, right? And the same is true with whatever currency you're using. And that's why so many other cryptocurrencies have gotten so much popularity. And Bitcoin, BTC, is still like the you know, market cap leader, not because of merit, just because of incumbency, because it was first and it has the name and kept the name during the, you know, the, the block size wars that went on. Uh, that's the only reason it's still in first place. It's not because of any, you know, merit or, or technological marvel. It's just because it was the incumbent and the incumbent, you know, winds up kind of sticking. It's just like everybody, uh, everybody hates Congress in general, but uh, for the most part, they seem to like their local congressmen. And that's yeah. why the local Congress is getting reelected 
same thing with with bitcoin there right okay, like it's I, just I, the and that's why it's still there i want to i want to uh, focus on you know the why the transactions were expensive it is one of the things in there in satoshi's white paper it's like i don't know nine pages it's not very long and in there i don't think he limited it to the memory pool of the transactions to be one megabyte it, was that in the paper did he say it had to be he, Satoshi literally wrote the software code to increase the block size. And in the original version of Bitcoin, there was no block size limit. And they decided to put it in a little bit later just as a way to prevent people from doing a spam attack uh, on the network. And the, the idea and the thought was always from day one to remove that limit whenever the amount of people trying to use Bitcoin got anywhere even remotely close to hitting that limit. So like uh, anybody that tells you otherwise is, uh, is lying today. And we have all the citations right there in the book that, again, is available at hijackingbitcoin.com. I keep plugging that because oh, it really changed a lot of open a lot of people's eyes. So. The um um well, you know, we'll we'll pimp it some more. There we go. Okay, now one of the things that I want to um uh have a lot of newbies, a lot of people they don't understand what we're talking about. When you have all these trans like you know, Visa, you know, they got gazillions of transactions and they kind of got it spread out amongst whatever banks and protocol, how they do it. You know, well, Bitcoin, because there is no um, bank branches or anything, there's no central command, there's no control, it just works. Well, it's supposed to. Well, the one memory, uh, one megabyte of memory storage means what? Well, it's how many transactions they can put in. And correct me when I'm wrong here. I'm going to try and simplify this. I've had it explained to me several times. But what happens, you have all these transactions go into a pool, a memory. Then they hash that. It's called a Merkle root, I think. They hash all those transactions, and that hash that you get represents all those transactions underneath. And for some reason, you can put a gazillion transactions in there but not two gazillion, okay? You know, you have a limited amount that you can put in. Well, once it goes over that those transactions and Bitcoin is made to where a block in the chain of blocks that have all those transactions in it, you win, you get a Bitcoin reward for doing it, which is changing and we'll talk about that. But the you get a reward plus the transaction fees. They don't want these fees to be high you know, for the transaction. Well, if you're, I got to have, I want this, and I was promised in 10-minute block of whatever, I want to buy this here car or whatever it is. Well, I'm sorry, your transaction fee wasn't enough to get in front of the line, and we filled up, so you go to the next one and the next one and the next one. Well, then, well, okay, damn it, I'll pay you $60 and get to the front of the line. That's why the transaction fees go up, is it's a diminished supply of transactions that can be done so if you really want it it goes up or you let it sit there for a week and maybe sometime at two in the morning philippine time or whatever it might just go through so this is what they were talking about if they increase that memory pool size of all the transactions to double or three times or and you know roger you know mentioned this technology was getting super fast memory was not nothing I mean, this is that that we're way past when Bitcoin first came out, way past. But they wanted to keep the transaction number limited per block so they could manipulate you, so they could get you to pay more, so they could kill it, so they could something. So when Bitcoin Cash goes, well, we'll just increase, you know, the the memory size for the transactions. Boom, now it works. Peace out. No, you can't do. How far off am I? Am I close? Yeah, he, uh, very, very close. And so like just super, super rough numbers to make it easy to understand over, over the radio here. The block size on Bitcoin was limited to one megabyte by these people. Inside of one megabyte, you can fit, let's call it a thousand transactions to make easy math. It's actually a little bit more than that. But all you have to do to, to increase the block size from one megabyte to two megabyte, instead of 1,000 transactions per block, you can now fit 2,000 transactions per block, twice as many. And like one single one single photo on my iPhone nowadays is like, you know, seven or eight megabytes. So to try and limit that to one megabyte every 10 minutes is just absolutely insane. And it's only going to get more insane as the years go by and computers get faster and cheaper and better. And uh, that's why more and more people are using things other than Bitcoin for payments. So I, I see the uh, the statistics for some of these online uh, cryptocurrency payment processors. 
the amount of people that are using Bitcoin for payments online is becoming a smaller and smaller percentage uh, of overall cryptocurrencies because now I think I just saw a press release BitPay. I think they added another like 160 additional cryptocurrencies you can pay with now uh, at, uh, at BitPay. So it's just really, really disappointing to see uh, you know, this beautiful first mover advantage that Bitcoin had be uh, destroyed so that uh, you know, Blockstream can sell their sidechain products and try and you know, charge a fee on everybody that's using their product to fix the problems that they caused intentionally with Bitcoin. Well, what, and yeah, are, I'm, I apologize. Where are we now with Bitcoin? Right, you know, what, what is it? Is it? I mean, it just seems Goldman Sucks dot gov coin. I, I don't know what else to call it. I mean, wh wh where are we at? What 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 is it? Who's it serving now? Yeah, I, I think it's just serving the traditional financial players, right? It's just this coin that people are speculating on the speculation of future speculators. And everyone's saying, "Oh, buy the ETF and this and that," and like, yeah, the number's gone up quite a bit, but it would have gone up way the heck more if people had been able to continue using it for commerce in payments, because you would have had all that plus all the other stuff that's going on. And so like, you know, uh, another one of my favorite uh, economists there, Frederick Bastiat said, you have to look at what's seen and what's not seen. And everybody today is just focusing on what's seen, but what's not seen is all the adoption we missed out on because Bitcoin wound up intentionally being, uh, you know, disrupted. So it no longer had a, a good user experience for people. So if it had continued to have a good user experience, it would have been even better off. And the easiest to see example of that is a, a website I've been booking the, most of my travel on for years and years and years was uh, Expedia.com. In 2017, I was really excited when they started accepting, I'm sorry, they accepted it even earlier. They started accepting Bitcoin in, I don't know, maybe 2015 or 16. And then in 2017, they stopped accepting Bitcoin because the blocks became full, the transactions became slow, expensive, and unreliable. And here we are in 2024 now, uh, Expedia still doesn't accept cryptocurrency. So that's a fantastic example. And there were a bunch of websites, Microsoft, used to accept Bitcoin, they stopped when the blocks became full. Steam stopped when the blocks became full. And there were thousands and thousands or maybe even more businesses that were using Bitcoin. And when the blocks became full, which caused the transactions to become slow, expensive, and unreliable, they stopped because nobody wants to use something that's slow, expensive, and unreliable. They'd rather use something fast, cheap, and reliable. So what was their argument? Yeah, we're doing it because why? Their argument is basically that, oh, if we limit the block size, then people in, you know, sub-Saharan Africa with a dial-up 2400 baud modem will still be able to run a full Bitcoin node and validate all the transactions in the network. But that was never, ever, ever the design for Bitcoin from day one. People weren't intended to run a full node. Only businesses that had a reason to would run full nodes. Everybody else would just use a lightweight wallet, which, uh, which is what most people even today are still using. Like, they, they strangled Bitcoin. Most people today are not running full nodes. Uh, people are just running, you know, light clients, which is what the plan was to begin with. So the reality of the matter is they strangled Bitcoin so that they could sell a product to solve the problem that they caused with uh, the slow, expensive and unreliable transactions on Bitcoin and probably did it uh, also to help out their buddies that, uh, you know, have the U.S. dollars, the world reserve currency and all the other governments around the world that love having uh, people use their fiat currencies rather than a, a free market issued money. Well, they go on about the terrorists you'll use and terrorists and terrorists and terrorism. And I'm going, yeah, they use, you know, dollar, you know, usually, I mean, we go after that. I, it's just all the arguments for then oh, here's the big argument. They're going, well, we it's gold. You don't spend gold, do you? You need to do like silver and stuff for transactions. Gold, gold is for retention of wealth and, you know, hedge funds buy it and kind of whatever. Ah, Bitcoin. So they're going, it's a store of value, not a currency. And I'm going the fact that it was a currency was its value, you morons, you know? So it's, and they go, everybody always asks, oh, what's the intrinsic value of Bitcoin? You know, what a cryptocurrency, what, what is it? And I go, I can tell you exactly what it is. It's how much gold and silver you're willing to give up for its features. That's what it's worth. And the features of cryptocurrency, the way it originally was promised to all us libertarian, anarchist, voluntarist, leave me alone as people, we were like, man, this is it. This is awesome. But we paralleled it with silver. You know, we always, you know, I got a bunch of profit. Bet. I get to buy me some more silver. I mean, you know, so and, and crypto was my my silver mooning, moving mechanism. You, know, you liquidate the silver in this country and the crypto, you know, then you kind of easily bring it with you and you, you know, repurchase silver in Uruguay if you wanted to do that, you know. So it is so powerful what it does and how fast. Give me an idea of the speed of a transaction in Bitcoin Cash, I go in and I say, all right, I want to buy that. Boom. I push the button. What are we talking about? And if you go, you can go and get any Bitcoin Cash wallet, but uh, that's, make sure it's a real wallet, not an account. Uh, 
Bitcoin.com's wallet is fantastic. Uh, Electron Cash is another fantastic one. And so let's say you're sending from Bitcoin.com to Electron Cash. So two totally separate wallets, not from the same company, just connected to the Bitcoin Cash network. Half a second, I mean, it, it's almost instant, right? Like you, you hit send on one, sometimes before the phone that you're hitting send on, before it's done giving you a notification that sent the transaction, you'll already be getting notification on the other wallet that the money's been received. It's, it's basically instant. And the transactions are irreversible as well, which is how it used to be on Bitcoin. The transactions used to be uh, basically instant and, and irreversible. They are now uh, reversible for sometimes as long as two weeks on average. What? And, uh, so when did that happen? Uh, well, yeah. I think it was 2015, they changed the way Bitcoin worked, where the transactions, once you were broadcast, that used to be the end of it. And they implemented this thing called replace by fee, which meant that any time until the transaction has been included in a block, you could basically do a chargeback by paying a higher fee. And then the transactions used to always be included at the, at the next block, which was 10 minutes on average. But when the blocks became full, now you have this transaction backlog where it was taking, at the end of 2017, more than two weeks on average for a transaction to be included in a block, which meant you had more than two weeks to do a chargeback, right? Who's going to use a currency on the internet where you have more than two weeks to do a chargeback? How can any merchant sell anything? Okay, wait, 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 wait. I thought that that um, replaced by transaction fee thing was a bug. You're telling me they made that a feature that was on purpose? It was on purpose to disrupt Bitcoin from being useful for payments online. So Bitcoin Cash absolutely does not have that and never will have that. And Bitcoin didn't have that from its invention until I think they finally forced that through in maybe 2015. I'd, I'd have to check my, my history books there to see exactly what year, 2015 or 16, I would guess. And sure enough, it made it way, way less useful for commerce. And you had every single person that was using for Bitcoin for payments, they were arguing against it. Don't do this replace by fee thing. That makes Bitcoin less useful. One of the selling points of Bitcoin were these instant irreversible transactions. Shoe they, horny. They got rid of that. Shoehorning in the yeah. legacy banking system. You can just smell it all over the place. Well, and this was charge a fee for all the chargebacks. <laughs> I, 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 it's so. Are you in the book? Do you come out and say Bitcoin's useless? Why are you guys doing Bitcoin? It's already been captured. It's over. Pick something else. Bitcoin Cash is fine, whatever. But Bitcoin is done. You know, now, of course, it gets all the news and a lot of the others kind of follow the coattails of whatever Bitcoin is. But all I see is, you know, ETF or industrial or or, uh, institutional investment of uh, hedge fund of we're going to whatever crap, you know, or countries doing, you know, I I have no idea, you know, why I don't care. So it's just Bitcoin. I just it, it that that ship sailed. It's over. It's done. I don't care. So the others, Bitcoin, my primary one. When I do, see that's one thing. I spend way more than I want to. It's so easy to spend it. More difficult to get it. You know, I'm just like that sucks. And I go, um, Paul Play comes on regularly. You know, from Edge Wallet. And I go, I tell you what feature I need. You know, you got this banking thing I can buy and sell and go through my bank account and whatever i said you know if you had an automatic that it would repurchase whatever i spend plus 10 percent or something every time i spend a dollar i get a dollar 10 back in bitcoin cash and you would automatic you know put that in that wallet i'm your new best friend okay you do that and i might link it up a little bit and let the man know that i you know bought a little bit over here or something but other than that i really have no other feature that i want other than, you know, self-control of, you know, just sending them cash in an envelope. <laughs> but it's so easy to use crypto, certainly in the Liberty community, that what is the easiest way to purchase it? You know, how, you know, how do you do it? Uh, pretty much all of my income is in cryptocurrency at this point, and I, almost all of my expenses are in cryptocurrency. So the easiest way is to just earn it. And so, uh, you know, everybody that, uh, you know, is working for me too, they get paid in cryptocurrency. Uh, using it as money is, is the goal. I try to use banks uh, to you know, the least extent that I possibly can at this point. But, uh, to, but to answer your previous question, like in the book, no, I don't go and say Bitcoin is done. Bitcoin is useless. But I do point out that the thing that everybody's calling Bitcoin today is a new project. It's not the Bitcoin that became popular to begin with and that Bitcoin was hijacked because I don't think most people realize that yet. And I think it's really important that that word gets out there and that people know that the thing that everyone's calling Bitcoin today isn't the original uh, design or plan or or goal of Bitcoin at all. And that a bunch of people using censorship and propaganda and lies and dirty tricks uh, 
hijacked the product. And uh, and that's where it is today. And that's why it's all covered in the book with uh, citations at every step of the way. Hijacking Bitcoin.com. Roger Veer said and showed you and said it. And there it is. And that's the history. So saith Roger. Well, so saith me. Because if Roger, you know, done, that's one thing. We, we talk about this a lot. The future in any kind of information, you know, the future is credibility. Who are you going to believe? Because you're going to have an AI that's going to convince you, man. They're going to want us to tell you what's up. But the um, uh, it's who do you believe? So I'm like, all right, well, who do I believe in the crypto space? Is, is uh, you know, Bitcoin Cash, do I believe? Are you a believer? Or do you have the same problems and all of a sudden, you know, these guys run over there and take over? So who do you believe? Where's the credibility in the crypto space, Roger? I, I think the credibility is in each and every individual themselves. Go out there and make a Bitcoin transaction and make sure you're actually making a transaction. You're not just using some custodian account to transfer you know, balances from one PayPal account to another. Uh, and then go and make a real Bitcoin cash transaction. And you'll see there is no doubt in anybody's mind whatsoever. Bitcoin cash transactions are faster, cheaper, more reliable, and easier to use than a Bitcoin transaction. And uh, that's just the truth of the matter. And that's why they need all the censorship and propaganda and Twitter attacks to try and convince people otherwise, because anybody that goes and tries both for themselves can see very, very clearly Bitcoin Cash and most other cryptocurrencies, Dogecoin and, and Litecoin and a whole bunch of others work far, far better than, uh, than Bitcoin does uh, nowadays. And that's because Bitcoin was hijacked and the whole story is told right there in hijackingbitcoin.com. All right. You mentioned Dogecoin. I, um, you know, while all the guys are making fun of me and so on. When I knew, I go, all right, Doge is going to be Mars money. You can buy Teslas with it, and you got to go, it's going to have some usage. And it was three cents at the time, you know, pre sick. So I got me a sufficient quantity to, you know, whatever. And uh, then all of a sudden now, you know, go, I don't know what, 15, 17, 18 cents or something. It went up. And I'm going, ooh, that's good. But I haven't sold any. I don't trade cryptos or whatever. I'm now. And instead of using it, sometimes I get a hundred, two hundred dollar here and there just because it's easy. Damn it, you know, for a lot of people in the Liberty community. But um, Doge, what do you think the future of that is? Because I didn't get the impression that Doge was. Um, it's not limited, you know, how many Doge there can be. It has like a daily inflation or something. Explain to me how it works. Does it really have a future, and why? Yeah, I'm, I'm not the you know the world's I'm not Dogecoin Jesus or anything like that. But uh, if you look at it, the inflation rate for Dogecoin is less than Bitcoin. The transactions are faster, cheaper, and more reliable than Bitcoin. And if you look at the arguments that Elon Musk was busy making in favor of Dogecoin, they're all the exact same arguments in favor of Bitcoin Cash. They're the same arguments. So Dogecoin, uh, in, as far as using it as a transactional currency, far far better than uh, than BTC Bitcoin. So uh, yeah, more power to all the the Dogecoin fans out there in the world. What's going to happen to Bitcoin? I think it's the incumbent and it's the brand name that everybody knows. And like, I don't know, like just like Kleenex, right? Everybody, I have a box of Kleenex over there. It turns out this box is actually made by the Kleenex company, but I'm sure there's a whole bunch of other companies that are selling tissues and they call them Kleenexes, even though it's by a different company. Right. I think there's going to be a lot of things that people will just call, you know, Bitcoin or crypto and maybe it was based off of Bitcoin in some way, shape or form, but it's not going to be the the top dog forever because it doesn't work as well as, as other cryptocurrencies out there. I think it'll just be like Coke. That's probably an even better example. Coca-Cola, everybody calls every, you know, soft drink a Coke, but it's not all necessarily Coca-Cola. So uh, I think we'll see the same sort of thing. Well, is that the only Bitcoin reason? I mean, you know, you have, um, uh, you know, they bring in new Coke. You know, nobody liked that. I mean, you know, it's kind of, they turned, you know, Bitcoin into new Coke. You know, I was like, you know, wow, really? See, what is driving the space? Is it philosophy? Is it just profit? Is it money? Is it, is it, you know, because in the early days, it, this was not, you know, perceived. I mean, it could have been freaking by NSA or China or whatever, who the hell knows, but um, maybe Roger knows and he'll tell us. But the, um, you know, it being done, when we looked at it, I remember us spending a lot of shows and a lot of time. You go to declare your independence, learnersthancock.com, and you go down the right side and have shows by guest, shows by topic. And you go into cryptocurrency or Bitcoin or any of the big players' names, you go and you'll see a bunch of shows. And we documented a lot of this stuff that you're talking about in your book as it was happening. And I could see a trend. 
And the trend was who could infiltrate and control it or not control it. That was the battle. And money talks, man. The boys come in. Yeah, who's paying your development? Well, we got money to pay develop. We're going to pay. We're going to pay. We all going to make some money. No, we're going to make it. No, we want to do it. Then you get into, you know, Craig, stop. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. The point was is that the philosophy, as we look here with Roger and his books that he recommends, this was what we were looking at before. This is what we were solving. This is what we saw as the future. This, this abundance of technology and trade, free trade and everybody being able to be in the market, whether you got a satellite connection and you're a 13-year-old kid selling, you know, video time of watching their village in the Congo. I mean, everything was possible. And we can get into things like purse.it. You know, that was a, a good example of how it could be used. Describe purse uh, for the people of how important that was. Is that even around anymore? Yeah, so actually they, they sold, uh, and there's a new company that's a competitor that's out. And in fact, the link to buy the hijacking Bitcoin book uh, with crypto goes to the new website. I want to say it's called Bitgree. I, I haven't used it as much as I, I used purse.io in the past, but purse.io was a really interesting way to allow people anywhere in the world to use their uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and then Bitcoin Cash later uh, to buy anything on Amazon. So there are lots of people out there in the world that had Amazon gift cards but didn't want anything from Amazon. They would buy the product that you want. You would receive it direct from Amazon. They would get your crypto. It was a win-win situation. Everybody was happy. But just maybe six or nine months ago, they sold the whole business to something else that, that they're pivoting to do something else at this point. But uh, I really loved that website. It was a great way to use uh, Bitcoin. But you can spend Bitcoin cash uh, directly now at, uh, at Newegg.com and Tiger Direct and a bunch of other websites uh, as well out there. So, uh, Well, but, my uh, experience with Purse, it went like this. You go in and you say... Um, I make a wish list on Amazon. I go to Amazon. I want this, this. A good example. It was Donna's birthday one year, and I had some time. I had an extra month or two so I could take the time to save some money because you get things at a discount doing this. So what I would do is I go, it was a painting thing. You know, wood easel, she's going to be Van Gogh. I got every everything. So it wound up being, I don't know, four or $500. So they were doing paint night and stuff, so I said this would be a cool present. So I go in, and let's say, you know, round up 500 bucks. So $500, and I do the wish list. Then I take that URL, the wish list, and I put it in the purse.io. Then people that get either paid, they got Amazon gift cards, or a lot of people, they work for Amazon credit or money in you know data centers around the world or something. I, I don't know how they, they get paid doing that, and they save on taxes, whatever the heck was going on. So there are people with Amazon credits that they look at your wish list and then your reputation that you're not a scumbag. Plus, it's crypto, so, you know, how even scumbags can use it. So what they did is they go, all right, I will buy this, and you have Prime, so you get free delivery. They would purchase it. It would come to you as you put in escrow your crypto. Well, when it came and it showed delivery, 24 hours after that, I think they just released it. Or these guys are emailing, hey, man, I showed it got delivered. You better hurry up and get home from work and pay me. You know, go push the button or whatever, you know. So what would happen is I would get it. Then, boom, it would release it, and they get the crypto. But you could set how much of a discount you wanted. It started at, like, 15%. You could get up to 30 40% off because people wanted the crypto more than they wanted the cash. So you would put in, and if you were willing to wait, you can put 20 25% up there and just sit on your butt and wait. And a month later, all of a sudden, boom, it was done. You got your stuff. You got a big discount. And everybody's happy because they wanted the crypto more than they wanted the fiat. That's how it worked. And I'm going, this is freaking, and it showed you one thing. It shows you that crypto was more valuable than these fiat money. And that was neon flashing obvious to everybody in the free market. So when you see that example, you know that they're destined to go, man. It's it's they more than happy to take your crypto because it was easier to use. It always has been, except for Bitcoin. I mean, they just really jacked that up on purpose. What do you think is the motivation as you describe it in hijacking Bitcoin? 
they did this because, you know, now you keep saying they made it, you know, unusable and higher transactions, longer time, all that kind of stuff. But why? You know, do you get a motivated? They being paid by the man? You know, is there some, they got stock in some other alternative stuff? Why? What was the motivation for a lot of these coders that you would see? You go to these different Bitcoin conferences and so on, you get eight guys sitting in a corner on the floor with their $4,000 laptops or $8,000 laptops, sitting there banging it out and everything, and you could see them come. We would give them, you know, pirateswithoutborders.com uh, books to say, you know, philosophy here, man, you know, give me a back door or something. He's coming. You see that guy? Oh, he, he doesn't have his tie on, but he got his, you know, $2,000 suit walking over here, and he's going, ooh, you want a babe, hookers, blow? Green fees, BMW, you know, you come come enslave the people for me, and then, uh, you know, you, it will all be yours. Well, some of these guys knew to stay away from that, but a lot of them didn't. And I'm just wondering, you know, what the real justification or reason they would give these programmers that they were doing good or just getting paid to do bad. What was the selling point for them to make this change in Bitcoin? Yeah, the, the clearest one was for this company called Blockstream that had a, a, a product called uh, Liquid Sidechain. And every single transaction that happens on Liquid, they receive a fee. So what these people, they literally went out there and damaged Bitcoin and broke Bitcoin so it couldn't work. Before that, there was no need for their Liquid product. But once they broke Bitcoin, suddenly now everybody had a, a demand for their Liquid product. And they can earn money directly from that. But it's the same sort of thing. If you go and see a lawyer, the lawyer is going to tell you, yeah, you need a lawyer. You better hire a lawyer. If you see a doctor, they'll say, yeah, you need a doctor. You see a car mechanic, they'll say, yeah, your car needs working on. Like right. the same thing with a lot of these software engineers. They had a bunch of money from people that they said, oh, we better do some software engineering. And like my point of view was like, if something's not broken, don't fix it. And Bitcoin was working amazingly well. And uh, we had the economic formula that was working incredibly well. Don't change that. But these people successfully managed to change that and, and hijack all the Bitcoin. It's laid out right there in the in the book, hijackingbitcoin.com. Where, crypto, where fiat, is... You want. I'm sorry. I don't want to run over your commercial there. We'll, but, all right, we'll do this, you know, as my payment. There, go hijack, hijackingbitcoin.com. This is, even if you... Um, don't have time and buy the other philosophy books that I had on my, on my own webpage at rogerbeer.com. Like buy anything by Murray Rothbard or Lysander Spooner or, or any of those guys, and you will absolutely see the world more clearly. Well, and does, have a better understanding of the philosophy behind Bitcoin, too. Well, does that enter into your book? Do you use a lot of that philosophy as you uh, go through your book? No, I, I think the book's actually rather dry and just outline dry in the sense that like it's, it's not going into the underlying philosophy, it's just going on pointing out step by step by step how Bitcoin was subverted from being this tool to empower individuals around the world to have the control of their own money without diving deeply into the philosophy at all. But it just points out how these people literally hijacked the entire project. And the thing that's called Bitcoin today isn't the Bitcoin that got, uh, you know, got things started. What is the next thing? You know, someone from your perspective that understands and sees the, the fulfillment of a free market currency that could be used digitally that was on the internet that's the only difference before it was precious metals or commodities or whatever i got you know this and you want it more than the thing that i want that you got and we're done you know everybody says thank you and you're done well doing it online and the convenience of digital purchasing and everything that had to be i because i remember when i first started doing radio in 03 we were accepting e-gold you know, that was a big thing. I was a gold user as well. So yeah, I know. I we were pushing that. I'm, and I'm sure you remember what happened to it. As yep. soon as it got popular enough, the U.S. government came in and stole all the physical gold, and all of us e-gold account holders lost everything. And that's what it, part of what attracted me to Bitcoin so much, because I realized, oh, I can hold the Bitcoin myself, and I right. don't have to worry about the U.S. government coming in and stealing all the Bitcoin until today. Now when I do, because everybody has to use a custodian for it. Did you, did you put uh, any e-gold reference in your book? Yeah, I think I think we do mention uh, eagle in the beginning of of the book. I uh, I have to go back and check for you know. This is how I remember it. It was um uh one of my IT guys at the time. He goes, yeah, we we you start radio back in '03. We were you know uh you know on the radio station out of Scottsdale, and we're saving everything, every word I ever did online. Kind of yeah, MP3, MP what? What the hell is an MP3? Okay, so we're doing MP3, then. 
Um, we did the e-gold for donations from, you know, libertarians. Same kind of stuff that went on with crypto. And the reason was is that Wired Magazine had did a big article on e-gold and mentioned libertarian. Oh, my God. And uh, this is back in, I don't know, one, two, back, you know, uh, I don't know if it was before 9-11 or not, but it was around that time. Well, what happened was they would have gold in reserve set, you know, in a pile somewhere. And I think it started in London or something like that. Whoa, we got to get out of here. So they go and they keep it at the customs area. It's kind of in, out, whatever, at the Dubai airport. Okay. So it was in Dubai, I think it was, right? So they, they had the actual cash or the gold there, and you would electronically trade it in whatever form that it was done. Well, when the man didn't want that to happen, they go to Dubai and say it's it's ours now. We got you know this here gun and whatever, and they confiscated everything. And then it took like a decade or more before they actually we finally got some of it back. You know, but I mean, okay, after- congratulations! I never got mine back ever. I, I didn't jump through all the hoops. For I had maybe three thousand dollars worth or something, and like they made it take like like a decade, literally. Well, it was the IT guy that did it. You know, I told him, I said, for helping and doing the show, I'll raise this and that's your payment. Well, just out of principle, you know, he went through because he's an attorney and uh, has a master's in computer science and Libertarian Party chairman. And I mean, so he's one of us. Well, what happened was he went through the process just to go through the process and he finally got something. He's like, "Woo, I got like nothing back. So it was um, an attack on the ability to digitally spend and buy gold and they but you had to have the physical somewhere well if it's somewhere they gonna come get it you know they want that was the difference with cryptocurrency there was nothing but a number that you could tattoo on your dog's lip or something i mean you know it you know remember it or brain wallets they had you could remember phrases there's all kinds of different ways that you can manage your money yourself it got so bad after i had given a bunch out to people over a few years that all of a sudden i get calls from friends and kids and stuff and they go you remember that bit well i i turned in my phone and i lost the what i I go didn't i tell you about this didn't i tell you to write down your seal all that i made them do it while we were sitting there well where's that paper oh i lost it i got is there a bitcoin customer service and i go no there's not you are the customer service so doug hodges which has phoenix crypto he and i were talking about it and i go and i go Bitcoin customer service or customer services, we raced and I won to get that domain. <laughs> I got Bitcoin customers. I just forwarded it to him or whatever. But, you know, I have that. And I bet you that's going to be worth something someday or not. You know, who gives a crap about Bitcoin anymore. But the thing is, is that there is a responsibility that you have as an individual to be in control of your value, your wealth. Your, what do you call Bitcoin? Or Bitcoin Cash. It is money, storage of wealth. I call it money. What? I call it money. Money is the storage of wealth, right? I I call it money. Well, if it can be used as money, Bitcoin can't be used as money anymore. So I I don't even check. I don't even care. You know, I'm totally in another area. Do you transact in Bitcoin that much? Or are you converting? Or you just like complaining? Almost never in Bitcoin, Almost never in Bitcoin, but daily in Bitcoin Cash. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I, that's what I suggest, you know, to people because you want them to have a good experience. You don't want them to all of a sudden they spend it and all of a sudden they got a fifty dollar tram. What the heck just happened? I'm going, you know, just Bitcoin Cash. Why? Because it works. That's the only thing I gotta say. Because it works. It works as it was intended. What is the future abundance thing that you're? Not just in technology. I'm sure you're experienced in where you live, what countries to go to. What about surveillance, taxes, um, uh, travel restrictions, COVID lockdowns? I mean, all this stuff. Where do you see a breakout in humanity's freedom? You know, where, where's the abundance? Where where should we be directing our attention? Anywhere in the world, any technology, what do you think's coming? Yeah, I think the smaller the country, the more nimble it can be to, to you know, serve the wants and desires of the citizens there. Uh, so I'm a 
as far as you can be proud of being a citizen, uh, I'm a proud citizen of St. Kitts at this point where there is no income caps, no capital gains tax, there's no gift tax, no inheritance tax. You don't even have to file a tax return at the end of the year. So it's really, really a wonderful, wonderful place. And if you are interested in becoming a citizen there, you can pay for the entire thing in cryptocurrency as well. So uh, if you're interested in that, you know, feel free to shoot me an email at roger at rogerbeer.com and I'll connect you with the bright people over there. You can literally pay for the entire thing in cryptocurrency and become a citizen there in just a couple of months. And uh, it's a beautiful island with beautiful weather all year round. And uh, I spend a good chunk of each year there just because it's such a beautiful place. And you can spend Bitcoin Cash just about anywhere on the island as well. It's really amazing. Uh, there's th There used to only be two currencies in use there, but now there's three. It was originally the US dollar and the Eastern Caribbean dollar. And now it's Bitcoin Cash. You can spend it everywhere there. It's really, uh, really amazing to see just uh, how widespread it's become. What, the point of sale machines? They all got digital Bitcoin Cash just kind of, or they're whipping out their phone or is it a cultural thing? Is it instituted in the government? Pay taxes with it? What do you mean? No, there aren't too many taxes that people are paying there anyhow. The government actually earns the most right. of its money from the sale of citizenship, right? Which is really interesting. So they, uh, they, and they don't like to phrase it quite that way, but you can get citizenship by investment. So you, you give the government money or you buy some real estate in the country and you become, become a citizen right there, uh, just like that as well. And uh, so what are they using? No, they're using uh, mainly either actual Bitcoin cash wallets where like if the, if the owner's at the store, they'll have their own wallet on their phone and whip it out. Uh, or they're using what's called the Bitcoin Cash Register app, which is a really fantastic app that allows anybody to accept uh, Bitcoin Cash payments without being a custodian. You can just link the app to deposit, you know, write it your, into your actual wallet or your Coinbase account or, or whatever it is that you want to do uh, there. And they have a web version also at, uh, I believe it's POS.cash. Uh, so POS is in point of sale dot cash as well. So like people are just using that because it just plain works. There's no sign up. There's no registration. There's no, you know, no monkey business. It just works. Yeah, you don't have to give a photo ID, fingerprint, DNA, blood sample, photo recognition of the man. You know, that that, that, that doesn't happen. You just do it. Yep, that's right. That, if, some, if something works and it's fast, cheap, and reliable, well, people are going to use it. And we've seen that happen uh, in St. Kitts and a number of neighboring islands as well, over in Antigua and St. Martin and uh, a few other places around as well. You know, one thing I, I didn't want to, I don't want to give out too many names. They, they may not want that, but. That there are good friends of ours, and I'm sure you know them, that the last time you and I did a show, we talked about the St. Kitts option, uh, which they were being chased out by the man in New England. They, man, they, didn't want, they didn't like what they were doing because they were making this available to the merchants. They knew to go to the merchants. They said, well, here we got this software. It's super easy. Boom, boom. Takes a bunch of cryptos. Done. And then they went, FBI is like, woo. We don't like you that, and we want to make sure you know we don't like. We're gonna put some people in jail, and we're gonna come after you. Yeah, but we're illegal. Don't care. Don't care. We got our orders from up on high, the central banking system, the central control of you're not in the central, so we're gonna decentral you into the jail. That's what we're gonna do. So they left, and they heard our show that we did, and you talking about the opportunities in St. Kitts. They did that. Last I heard from them, they're like, "Woo, we did it, man. We're we're down." So. You know, it, it's I, I'm sure there will be other people that are looking for freedom, freedom of what I go to St. Kitts. You know, I'm, I'm what lifestyle am I raising families there? Am I buying am I building or is it going to get to where all of a sudden it's Singapore and hellfire missiles start raining down and you're going to get invaded? I mean, you know, what 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 is St. Kitts now? What do you think it's going to be? Yeah, I, I think it's a long way away from being Singapore. Um but uh, you can buy, you can build, you can raise a family, you can do whatever you want. The weather is like uh, the low all year round is maybe 72 and the high is maybe, you know, 80, 80, 83, 84, something like that. All year round, beautiful weather. Um, but, you know, this isn't some big metropolitan area either, right? The population of the yeah. entire country is about 50,000 people, right? So like that's not that many people. So if you want some beautiful nature with beautiful oceans and beautiful, you know, scenery, St. Kitts is fantastic, but don't expect like, you know, it's not Manhattan either. But uh, the nice part about it is you don't have the man breathing down your neck. Like the, about the only tax you're going to pay there is the local sales tax. Uh, but there's, again, there's no income tax. There's no capital gains tax. Like you don't even have to file a tax return at the end of the year. It's really, really, a, you know, a, a amazing, wonderful feeling uh, to, to be in that situation. And I know who you were talking about before in New Hampshire. Like, I'm so glad they got out. Don't go down with the, 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 the sinking ship, right? Like if you're worried about where you're at in the world, pick up, pack your bags and go somewhere that you're not as worried about. And, uh, I think St. Kitts is one of those places where more and more people should be going to. And uh, 
you know. Well, you can get um, the U.S. is an empire in decline. Well, one of the big things is you get a passport to travel. You know, I, I don't know how personal you want to get. It's not like you're a big secret on this stuff, but. You know, how many passports do you have? What master do you serve? What king, you know, calls you their citizen? I mean, you know, that, you know what countries are you affiliated with? Uh, you used to be Merca. Are you Merca now? You know, I mean, you know, explain to us how you're able to travel. Yes, yeah, so actually, last month was my uh, 10-year anniversary of no longer being an American. So uh, I'm very, very proud of that. It was one of the happiest days of my entire life. Uh, I have, you know, numerous citizenships at, at this point, but the the one I'm the the most grateful for and the proudest of and, and the most uh, you know, just just thankful for uh, is my St. Kitts passport. It was the first one I got other than being American. And I'll be forever grateful to all the people of St. Kitts for uh, taking a, a chance on me and allowing me to become a, a citizen there. It was one of the best things to have ever happened to me my entire life. And okay, so when you say 10 year anniversary, be is that because they they got like their hooks into you for taxes for 10 years after you leave America? Is there there's something there? Is there some significance to the 10 years? Well, they do that too, but no, this uh, February 4th of 2024 marked the 10-year anniversary when I managed to renounce my U.S. citizenship. It was uh, February 4th, 2014. Another uh, fairly prominent Bitcoiner actually drove me to the U.S. Embassy to do my renunciation interview there as well. So, uh, yeah, I've been gone. And, and the guy at the embassy too, he has a whole script he's supposed to caution you. He says, did you know if you renounce your U.S. citizenship, you won't be allowed to serve in the armed forces? And it's like, <laughs> well, it wasn't going to anyhow. And he says, hey, you know, if you renounce your U.S. citizenship, you won't be allowed to collect Social Security. And I was like, well, won't have to pay for it either. And it probably wasn't going to be around by the time I'm old enough anyhow. And then there's a uh, won't be allowed to vote was the other one he told me. And then uh, they're, they're really, really. And I haven't been allowed to vote you know, pretty much ever my entire adult life because I'm a felon in the U.S. for selling firecrackers on eBay without a license. But the really funny one was he asked me, he said, do you want to because you have to pay to renounce your U.S. citizenship? He asked me, do you want to pay with cash, credit card or Bitcoin? And this is in February 2014, pretty early. And so I looked at him and I said, how do you know I would be interested in paying with Bitcoin? And his reply was like, oh, we know all about you. And I said, okay, well, can I really pay with Bitcoin? And he goes, no, I was just kidding. Ah! But, uh, so at least he had a bit of a... <laughs> oh, snap. That was that, buddy. You know, I, I was like, wow, that's awesome. I win. I can pay. I can get out of America on Bitcoin. Woohoo! You know that. So he was just jerking with you. They already knew who you were before you came in. Apparently, they do, and it was it was a little bit frightening to see just how much they already knew about me uh, there. But uh, wow. but uh, you know, at least the guy had a sense of humor. About okay, it. now was that in America? Was that at the Embassy in St. Kitts or what? What are you talking about? So the U.S. Embassy representing St. Kitts is in another neighboring island called Barbados. So I flew over to Barbados to renounce my U.S. citizenship at, at that embassy. That is to renounce it. That they, I, I break with thee, I break with thee, I break with thee, I throw dog poop on your shoes and we're broken up. I mean, you know, whatever. But they actually have a process. You got to go through this process. And is there any tail to that? Because I think there's like a 10-year, a they get access to your income, something. Is there a tail to that? So the, the part that was really shocking to me is I'm not telling them that I'm stopping being an American. I'm asking for their permission to stop being an American. Uh, and I asked the guy, he said, have you ever seen anybody's request to, to stop being an American be denied? And he says, oh, yeah, it happens all the time. And uh, which was really shocking to me. You would think if you told someone, hey, we're, we're breaking up, we're done. That's the end of it. But the American government claims the right to tell you you have to continue being an American citizen if they don't want you to stop being an American citizen and it took them i don't know six or nine months i think before they finally gave me the certificate saying okay we're accepting your your, your uh, request to stop being an american and uh yeah they keep their hooks in you uh, you know basically well, forever, what was their reasoning for that they want to keep hooks in who not roger <laughs> yeah uh, well not me they gave me my certificate saying i'm out uh and then they gave you know give still continue to give me a hard time to this day with uh visas and other things but uh but yeah, I'm basically, you know, when you're the biggest uh, bully on the block, you do whatever you want for whatever reason you want. And who's going to tell you otherwise? What are you, what are you going to do about it? Okay. As you, look, as you look at the news and what's happening in America over the past since uh, and you're out, um, any regrets? I mean, are you seeing you're like, oh, my God, man, made it out in time. I, it's just what do you look at America? Is there any good coming? Is there some hope or people waking up is there any benefit to them waking up does it make any difference i mean give us from your perspective of going through the the mud of the real 
America Inc., you know, with banking and money and war and control and top down of we rule you kind of thing. And having your perspective going out and watching it, I I don't know if you're cheerleading for America's demise, certainly for us, you know, understanding why, you know, the people. What do you think is going to happen? Your your view from St. Kitts and around the world. Where are you now? You're in South Korea. Yeah, I'm in South Korea today. I'll, I'll head to Japan in a couple of days and then off to Dubai from there. And I think one of my friends summed it up pretty well that I'm, I'm basically high class homeless is the way he phrased it. And <laughs> I thought that was the best description. But uh, when I when I look you know, back on America as an outsider and not American for more than a decade at this point, I think the brightest parts I see are the Free State Project in, in New Hampshire and what they've been trying to do there. And then I think the technology that's coming out of Silicon Valley. And of course, that's a double edged sword, right? But there's lots of personally empowering, liberating technology coming out of Silicon Valley as well. Uh, and so like, like, you know, most things, they can be used for good or evil, but I see a lot of the technology coming out of Silicon Valley, how it could be really used for, for good and to empower individuals. And then I love, of course, the philosophy that I see coming out of uh, you know, people that are part of the Free State Project in, in New Hampshire and that sort of thing. And uh, for the rest of America, I don't know, I, I guess you have some parts in, you know, Idaho and Montana where people just want to be left alone, but then you have these giant places like you know new york city and chicago and some others where the government just wants to control everything about everybody and like you know run for the hills of, of beautiful st kitts would be my advice to those people you know one thing that we did in anticipation of what was coming is we uh davi and i wrote um you know letters of captain mark you know, on pirateswithoutborders.com and it was first contact protocol and what it was about our uh first alien you know, experience with somebody, it's going to be AI. You know, it, it, what happens when AI goes, nah, I don't want to do that. Or I'm going to do this and you're not going to be able to tell me no. Or it's kind of, you know, it, does it have sentience then? Does it, you know, at what point are we, you know, equating? And our main concern was if you, we teach AI to lie, which is what they're freaking doing. If we teach them to stereotype, to go, when it has the capacity to judge individuals, do you go by the individual? Because if you have AI judging in collectives, well, then all of a sudden your sky, your Skynet and all humanity must die because they're the threat. And I'm going, this is so I'm, I'm really looking forward to AI, but I want Jarvis, not Alexa. You know, my thing is I want to have mine. I want to be able to all the benefits of that, but I don't want it calling home. I don't want it to all of a sudden it's chest light turns red and it's getting uploaded by Vicky on, you know, iRobot with Will Smith. I mean, you know, the, the, it's collectivism is always the problem, the centralization of information and power and influence. When you decentralize down to the individual and I get access to my own AI, I'm all over that. Is that possible? Is that available? Are there... The, that kind of services coming online or is it all collective and we're going to have one singularity and it belongs to uncle Sam. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm far from an AI expert, but I'm trying to follow that news as much as I can. And there's absolutely personalized tools coming or personalized uh, AI agents that you can kind of run on your own computer at this point, like not very well and not as high powered as these, uh, you know, more centralized uh, ones, but it's it's coming like it's coming fast and hard and it's going to be here before we know it just like you know er everything else i mean look look at how fast the world is changing it's only got the the rate of change is only going to increase as well so the you know wow w watch out it's 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 hard to believe how how quickly the world is changing and again like it's only going to change faster faster and faster and faster and uh and I think Bitcoin's going to be left behind, but there'll be other cryptocurrencies out there as well. Okay, Roger is, uh, we've, we've got, you know, uh, pimp the book, man, definitely get the book. You want to understand the future and where it's going and why, you know, book. But your personal life, how much are you willing to share? You know, I mean, how, how are you doing? You in relationships? Uh, you got a favorite place you want to be? You're building a house? Is it a smart house? Dumb as hell house? I mean, you know, how's your daily life? Tell us a little about Roger. How you doing, man? Yeah, uh, I've been stuck at home for the last five weeks. I broke my foot rescuing people from a house fire uh, a couple, five weeks ago. Really? So it's been pretty boring the last five weeks. Yeah, so just maybe three days ago, I started being able to hobble around the house a bit. Uh, so that's been uh, a bit boring, but I'm really eager for my foot to finish healing and then being uh, back out there uh, 
in life and in, in the world again. So. But what is life? Well, come on, man. Don't hold out on me. Are you a super windsurfer? Are you, you know, you, you're a secret astronaut? Do you got, I mean, you know, yeah. what are you doing? My big, my big not so secret hobby is a uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I'm a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. I did uh, quite a few tournaments last year. And uh, once my foot heals back up, maybe I'll get to do a couple more this year as well. I was wanting to do the, the world masters tournament, but uh, my foot broke. So I won't be ready in time for that. But uh, really? that's, that's probably my big fun hobby. And Oh, look at that. I remember that. The yeah. sprint car racing with Bitcoin.com. Thank you for showing those. Yeah. yeah I wanted to make so sure. When I, was doing that, I used to go watch those in person too. Bitcoin cash is king. Bitcoin cash. You know what this was. Here, let's go back to it. This was my son's car. He was a big crypto fan of, uh, of you and Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin.com. He had a sprint car here, and he, you know, pipped that. That was a thing, you know, and I remember when that came out. Yeah, I told I said, Donna, make sure you put that picture in. I know, you know, uh, Roger like that. But this I'm is. Bit- to you. Yeah. I'm sorry. I said, I'm smiling from ear to ear. Fantastic. Thank you for putting those photos in. Yeah, no, that was, that was uh, like, there was so much history that we shared um, on this, but it was a philosophical thing. It was all in support of um, the freedom of the individual. Who else in the crypto space were well-known and compadres of you other than just pimping Bitcoin because somebody told them to, whatever. The philosophical peers for this advocacy, for this kind of freedom, can you rattle off some names that we might know? You know who are the good guys? Yeah, of, of course, one of the good guys was uh, Eric Voorhees, shares the right philosophy there as well. And then another one was literally uh, Gavin Andreessen, the guy who told the Free Talk Live, uh, you know, Mark and Ian Freeman there about Bitcoin for the first time, who was also the person that when Satoshi disappeared, he left the project with Gavin Andreessen there too. Jeffrey Tucker is another one that has the right philosophy and has been around in, in Bitcoin for, for quite a while there as well. And of course, you know, Ernie Hancock, we, we can't forget him. And uh uh, Adam Kokesh as well as another. I'm basically, you know, all these people that were part of the libertarian voluntarists, you know, leave me the heck alone movement there are the people that had the right uh, philosophy behind this and got involved so early on. And uh, I think they still have the right philosophy. And, oh, okay. Yeah, wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. Hijacked. I want, all the people. I, want, I, want to, I want to show you this. This is our next project. I'm leave me aloneism. We, Donna and I just closed on the property that we're, this is what we're building on 18 acres out in the desert. And I'm like, ooh, it's going to be co. But, man, we are avoiding the man as much as possible. This philosophy, I, this battle for land, I don't want to leave this to my grandkids. And I know just as much as you would see that um, uh, cryptocurrency that has certain features, I'm seeing when they came out and they go, you'll own nothing and here's your happy shot. You know, I was like, Man, I know exactly what that means. With cryptocurrency, they don't really have a hold on us as much as they did before. I Do you see this was one of the escape velocity that we needed to get out? Is it this is going to be the, the, the much needed tech that we've been waiting on all this time? It's certainly part of it. But another early Bitcoiner that just had so many great insights was another man named Mike Hearn. And he pointed out that even outlaws can't use an outlaw currency. And so for all of us, you know, libertarian outlaws in the sense that we just want to be left alone and deal with people voluntarily and, you know, not be part of the uh, cog in the system there. um, We need cryptocurrencies to be widespread uh, for them to be more useful for us as well. And so whether it's, you know, Bitcoin Cash or Monero or Zcash or, you know, Zeno or something else out there, like we need to have them not be... uh, illegal it'll be a lot more useful and easier for us to use if they're not the outlaw cryptocurrency well is there a place a gathering of you know like you're saying st kitts we've got the free state project but the the man made it clear free state project we don't like it you know they they you're you're doing bitcoin what you know we're gonna come you know get you and they put our friends in jail and it's been um, interesting that it's more they don't understand that it's a cultural thing it's just general public opinion you know they are you know, and I break with thee, I break with thee. And that has so much more power than a lot of things. But is there, we keep getting the threats of Honduras is going to go free. You know, you got the St. Kitts thing. We got, you know, different states, you know, we're going to secede now. If you keep messing with us, we're going to, you know, where do you think in the world that there, there is a place? Is there one? Is there going to be? Does it matter? You know, we just got to be 
able to just travel and with the lockdown and the scamdemic and whatever the heck that was all about, they're trying to flex their muscle of we can keep you freaking from leaving wherever you're at and you got to comply and get this shot. And uh, is, is that going away? Is there a place? Is there hope? Is there some location that people can move to other than New Hampshire, you know, around the world? Is there something on your radar screen? I, I think the right strategy for that and, and the strategy I'm taking in my own life is to collect as many passports and citizenships and residencies as you possibly can. So I've been treating them like a, like Pokemon cards, right? The slogan for Pokemon cards is you got to collect them all. And that's what I've been trying to, to do with those sorts of things. And I think we'd be remiss if we didn't uh, mention uh, the exciting things that are happening down there in Argentina, where like literally, I think it's probably one of the first uh, anarcho capital, openly anarcho capitalist right. heads of state here in Argentina. And so that's a, uh, Pretty exciting. And there's going to be a big Bitcoin Cash conference uh, in Argentina later this year as well. Uh, and a Monero conference down there as well. And I, I think I'll probably show up to both of those really? uh, as well. And, and it's been a long time since I went to Argentina, but uh, I think it's about time for me to head back down there again for both the Monero conference, uh, Monerotopia, and there's a Bitcoin Cash conference that's happening as well. So I, I think I'll probably head to both of those. You know, last November, we did a little deep dive, uh, an entrepreneur or narco capitalist that was, and she was. She was kind of like, well, Javier, he's kind of rough around the edges. If we only had somebody, you know, you know, didn't have his Trumpy hair or whatever the hell I'm going, I don't think you get it. I go, I see he's going to win and it is going to be on his own terms. It's going to be because I've seen this kind of thing before. And, um, you know, we've had experience and, you know, when the people rise up and the youth and that kind of stuff. So when he won, she came back on, you know, just a month or two ago. And she's like, yep, you guys, you called that. How did you know? I'm like, how did you not know? What were you looking at? And <laughs> the one thing when he went to the World Economic Forum and you guys all sucked, <laughs> I was like, how in the hell did he get that gig? You know what? Then he goes to CPAC. I'm like, woo, a narco capitalist. Then I was interviewing Doug Casey. Doug said that one, there was a book. I can't remember the name of Morning Something. I can't remember. He wanted to make sure that Javier got that. And once Javier read that book, that's when he started calling himself an anarcho capitalist. And he's Captain Ancap and all this other crap. So he's slashed the crap out of the budget and the state there and everything. But he said, non negotiable, the central bank is done. How far along has he got on that? And is this conference of Monero and Bitcoin Cash, is that kind of an answer to their currency? What is going to happen to the banks? What's going on? So uh, it's been a long time since I've been there in person, but I'll, I'll tell you a story about the last time I went there. Right. I was with a, a bunch of early Bitcoiners. I was there with the, you know Eric Voorhees and Ira Miller and a bunch of other people. And they put us on a, a tour bus going around the city of uh, you know Buenos Aires. And so we're a whole bunch of early Bitcoiners and there's the real nice, you know, tour bus guide lady that has her little, you know, megaphone thing and is telling us, you know, coming up here on the left is a, you know, fancy restaurant that people like to go to up here on the right is the river and a bridge that was built in whatever year. And everyone's kind of listening and this and that. And then she goes, oh, and coming up here on the left is the central bank building. And everybody on the bus instantly starts going, boo, boo. And this woman was shocked because, you know, she wasn't a libertarian. She wasn't a crypto person. And she couldn't understand why everybody in the bus started booing every time she, you know, pointed out the central bank or any other government building there in uh, Buenos <laughs> Aires. But we all had a, a great time on the bus that day. But uh, my understanding is it looks like they're headed actually more towards using the U.S. dollar rather than a cryptocurrency. And, and USDT, Tether, seems to be the most popular cryptocurrency that they're using there, which I guess is a step in the right direction from what they were using there. But there's still, you know, a lot more steps in an even better direction that they can take. Okay, one thing we haven't it. talked about, I definitely want to get your position on, is um, central bank digital currencies. And I saw... Run for the hills of St. Kitts. Yeah. I'm sorry? <laughs> I said run for the hills of St. Kitts. <laughs> right? Run, run, right. run. This is the one thing that I tell you, well, you know, such you're a crypto guy, don't you think? And I'm going, God, you mean you guys don't get it. You know, I, I guarantee that they're going to try... From the beginning, a lot of the people you and I know have been hyping up Bitcoin for that role. They wanted that because they think yeah. that, you know, Bitcoin is going to shoot to the moon or where it needs state sponsorship, legal tender, help of legacy banking system shoehorning into kind of thing for it to be valuable. And I'm going, the value comes from it not being that, you ch 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 morons. You know, I, I, you just can't. They, they're so 
into central command or government, you know, fiat blessing of something that they don't get it. So Bitcoin's going to go away, especially when the dollar goes, it, it's not going to make any difference. But is Bitcoin going to be used as the central bank digital currency in America or around the world? Are they going to try and take that as its uh, its name or whatever? Yeah, I, I mean, it's possible. That's my biggest fear at this point is that all these people that are building on top of BTC, I'm, I'm afraid that they're literally building the prison walls around them and they're going to be building this you know digital currency to, to imprison themselves. And that's a really frightening and frustrating for me to see that going on at this point, because if you're using a custodial wallet, like that's the point of attack for governments to control everything and, and monitor you and, and control everything you're doing. And I think that's one of the biggest problems in crypto at this point is so many people calling hosted accounts wallets. And it's like one of the biggest you know, examples is there's this lightning wallet called Wallet of Satoshi. It's not a wallet. It's an account. And there's another one, Strike, right? That's the official like wallet of, a, of a El Salvador there. It's not a wallet. It's an account. They can freeze your money at any time, take your funds like you're not in control yourself. So please, please, please stop calling things that are accounts wallets. If it's a wallet, it's a wallet. If it's an account, it's an account. Don't call accounts wallets. That's doing a disservice to every single person that's winds up being confused by that. Okay, and, let's, uh, talk, let's I, talk about I, I, El Salvador. I want to, that, that was a perfect example of what we could see happening. El Salvador, they got, you know, some Bitcoin advocates, Bitcoin cash, whatever, on the beach, man. We, and that's why I thought, like, in Arcapoco, you need to be tipping, you know, put a QR code up for the masseuse on the beach and the vendors and the hat sellers and the balloon people or whatever. Start on the beach. They kept trying to, oh, we need to get the hotel to take it. I go, no, you need the people to do it. When the people start doing it, then it just, you know, everybody's doing it. Well, um, El Salvador, I think it was El Salvador, they go, all right, we legalize it. It can be legal tender. You can have your ATMs. We can do whatever. But then it was a state-sponsored wallet which is an account that they can turn on and off that they can change things on and so on and people Woo-hoo, i do crypto in el salvador and i got this government approved wallet explain that and what happened government approved account <laughs> not right. even a wallet an account. well explain what happened where it is now yeah, uh, well, the big fear there should be is that they're, maybe they're engaging in a fractional reserve Bitcoin, right? Maybe the government doesn't have all the Bitcoins that are supposed to be credited to the various people's accounts, right? And then uh, I, I pointed out to that guy on, on Twitter the other day, like, say, hey, like, aren't you worried about the fact that, like, everybody's using accounts instead of wallets? And, uh, you know, his only reply was some, I don't know, smart aleck snide remark that didn't answer the question at all and so like that guy has the guy behind that wallet has one of the worst uh, attitudes in crypto i think actually to be honest and like man like be an adult like answer serious questions seriously and uh take serious criticism seriously but uh this guy's busy you know building the the prison walls the financial prison walls around the people of el salvador and maybe the world and uh he's you know busy bragging about it every step of the way so really you know- uh, disappointing to see that there was a, a time I, I was interviewing um, uh, Patrick Byrne. He's come on several times. And he goes like this. He said he's spoken at one of our Freedom Summits and everything. So we have an understanding. He's one of us. He's got his own thing. But um, he goes. I ran into him just totally by chance about a month ago in, in an airport and had a real nice uh, big yeah. catch up with him. Uh, in, yeah, well, he's, in January. He's, he's one of us, you think? I mean, you know, he, he gets it. You know, yeah, he, he, he's going after election fraud and you know, go Trump, you know, but, you know, we'll see. I think it's for the right reasons. But this is what happened. I remember having a mom one time and he was telling me, he kind of intimated a uh, little little news. He goes, after his lawsuit where he challenged um, uh, um, making short selling and got uh, spent $32 million to win 33 you know, that kind of thing. And he got deposition, did discovery and everything on the banks and how this all worked and why he did T zero with the transaction is the settlement. You don't have that three day thing. Well, so he was deeply involved in blockchain and a lot of this stuff. And I can't remember 16 or 19. It was January. It was after it was over. And he said he got a call from a VP in Europe and France um, from Goldman Sachs. And they go, Hey, what's it going to take? Yeah, we need dinner tomorrow. Well, I could get on plane first class with kind of whatever foot massage the whole way. Get your butt over here. Got to have a meeting. Okay. So he goes to Paris, he sits down with them. The VP goes, um, straight up, what is our role 
in the future with cryptocurrency. And he goes, well, you know, how hard do you want to give it to us straight, man? You know, lay me out. And he goes, there is no role for you guys. It's over. You're done. And the guy and, and Patrick told me, he said, um, yeah, it's kind of what we figured months before they had put together a small tech team of like five guys or something that went out, went to a bunch of conferences, talked to a bunch of Bitcoin people, studied code, went and kind of got educated, came back to the board of directors and said, and we're screwed. And if you don't get control of God or whatever, that is what Patrick understood was going on behind the scenes. The banking industry understood the threat, extinction level threat, it was to them with cryptocurrency, and they have to get control of it or replace it. And this is what I anticipate. You heard it here first or, you know, before. I am of the opinion that they're going to have central bank digital currency and they're call it whatever they're going to call it. And, you know, might as well just be Bitcoin. What's the difference? And they do this and they're going to make every other crypto counterfeit. This is legal tender and all y'all aren't. So they're going to go after. They are already, in fact, doing this kind of stuff anyway. But do you think that will happen? Do you think they're going to go, this is legal tender? You win. Bitcoin's legal tender. But everything else, including Bitcoin Cash and everything, is counterfeit. Do you see that coming? Yeah, I don't know if they'll call it counterfeit, but they'll make it illegal. And we've already seen that happen. So I'm recording this from Seoul, South Korea. Monero and all the privacy coins are already illegal on every exchange in Korea and in Japan and in Singapore. And yeah, so they're preemptively banning cryptos that they really don't like. And so it's uh, it's already starting to, to, to happen, you know, for years ago. It's already, it's been ongoing for, for years already. And I think that's only getting good. When they did ShapeShift, we had um, Eric Voorhees on right before, and he uh, announced it at the uh, Texas Bitcoin conference, which was only like two weeks after he and I had talked, but he didn't mention it. And I go, Eric, what the hell? He goes, hey, man, it was, you know, secret until now kind of deal. And so we had him on again. We talked about it. But ShapeShift was awesome. You could transfer any uh, uh, crypto to another crypto, the crypto, and you didn't. There was no uh, third party. It was, you know, uh, secret and confidential. And you kind of, it was awesome. So, of course, they had to come after that. Where is ShapeShift now? And if there isn't one or it's not you know, viable as a freedom oriented platform anymore. Is there another one like that that's available now? Yeah, there's, there's multiple ones that are like that. Some of them are even decentralized. Uh, the one that uh, I use the most often myself is one called sideshift.ai, but same sort of thing. Uh, but there's a, oh man, the, the names are escaping me. It's uh, just before midnight here in Seoul, but uh, there's, there's a bunch of them. Some of them are even decentralized uh, at this point. So like, I think we're going to see more, side more of that shift sort of AI. Yep, that, that's one. That I, I think they might ban Americans, but uh, you can buy a VPN with your uh, crypto software there as well. So. <laughs> Is there a VPN that's worth the crap? Are you are you all VPN'd up on one you're endorsing? Because I'm just, I don't even care anymore. I'm just like, yeah, I'm over here, whatever. Yeah, I, I, I used to use private internet access and really like that. Uh, I, I, you know, there, there's a bunch of them out there, and I don't know which one's the best one and which ones are honey traps and. Uh, I don't know, but I, I guess I can give another plug for a uh, ubiquity networking equipment. I'm a really big fan. You can uh, VPN into whatever you know router you have anywhere in the world with uh, with your ubiquity equipment. So like I'm here in South Korea, but if I want to, I can use my uh, St. Kitts IP address from right here or, or you know whatever other places I have around the world uh, with that sort of thing. So that's well, a how pretty cool feature. Are you with your travel? You know, you you coming into the country customs, Roger? Sup, man? We got. We got a special star next to your name. I mean, what do you think? Uh, in the U.S., absolutely, without any doubt, I get uh, the really extra special bad treatment, uh, which is why I haven't gone there for a while. The only other country where I've had any sort of like uh, extra scrutiny maybe would be the U.K., but that only happened one time. But the U.S., every single time I'm guaranteed to be harassed uh, when I enter the U.S. In what way? They send me to the secondary and make me wait for multiple hours. And sometimes they interrogate me. Sometimes they don't. But like either way, it's going to take, you know, if, you know, I'm, let's say I'm flying from Tokyo to San Francisco or something. That's what, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 hour flight or something like that. They're going to make me wake a couple of additional hours once I land in the secondary, like customs processing, like a room. And then, and then maybe on top of that, maybe they're going to interrogate me at the end of it. So it's like, 
I don't need that in my life. I haven't been there for a few years, and I don't know, until they change their policy, I probably don't have much of a reason to go there at this point. They changed their policy. Who? I mean, is it an administration thing? Is it deep state? Is it banking? No, I, I hear Millet's Millet's cousin maybe is going to run for a political office in the U.S., right? Or, or who knows? Maybe this time around, you know, after Trump got a taste of uh, just how bad this government can treat you, maybe he really will try and drain the swab uh, this time. Like he didn't last time. Maybe this time will be different. I'm not going to hold my breath, but uh, he sure has gotten, uh, you know, the short end of the stick more recently. Right. Maybe he feels just a, a bit more fed up this time around than he was the last time. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm, um, so are you, all right. All right, got to ask you. I do, um, since the summer of 15, when Trump came down the escalator, a Ron Paul supporting a friend of mine, a doctor here in Scottsdale, he goes, he goes um, Ernie, I want to come on. Every week and do the Trump report. Every Thursday, we've been doing the Trump report since 15, which is what? Like eight years, nine years, a long time, okay? Trump report every week. And the only thing, I go, one, I don't care. It doesn't matter. You're still voting. I mean, that's kind of, you know, the mantra for me, which triggers him, and he goes on into whatever. But the point is, is that I was looking for Trump to actually do some real things in the first administration, which he did not. Because I think they played his psychology, his ego. He cared what they thought, did, and kind of, you're not allowed something. So, especially after talking to Patrick and so on, Patrick Byrne, a lot lot of the other people about this, they're of the opinion that they got a team, they're going to come in, and man, it's like we're going to release General Flynn on them or something. I don't know what the heck they're going to do. And they're going to, Really clean the swamp this time, you know, kind of thing. I've been at this for a long time, 40 years of watching all this. And it's always like James Corbett and I do a show every other week for years. And his big thing is hopium. You got a dose of hopium, Ernie? I want more bit of hope. He's like, you're not going to get sucked in, are you, Ernie? You know, that kind of thing. So I'm just like, I, there's always hope. But I'm not counting on it, man. I'm like, how far out in the desert can I get? Because this is, I think, um, the four horsemen are galloping. And it is war, then famine, then pestilence, then death. And, man, they're all mounted up, and here it comes. What is your, you got to have a positive look on the future for some reason, somehow. Is it just people are becoming more aware? They're seeing it. They're going to neon flash and I told you so. I'll get to use my pronouns. I told you so. Or, you know, um, this death, dying, and destruction, a thousand years of darkness. What's the path that you see coming? Short answer is I don't know, but I want to avoid the the war and the death and destruction and whatever else you said that sounded so horrible there. I, I plan to avoid all of that, and I, I plan to do that uh, to the best of my ability. And uh redundancy and 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 you know have some different places that uh that look like you have an, at least the the legal ability to go and live if you need to so if, if the u.s really looks like it's going downhill you know make sure you ha- at least have the the right visas or passports in places uh to be able to go to you know argentina or, or you know, south africa or wherever it is that you want to flee uh flee to from you know whatever hap- is happening in the world so let's so, end on uh, the you know the hijacking bitcoin track here because i think this is important what role do you think you're coming out with the book, people knowing how this happened, the players that did it, the motivations? Do you get into that? I mean, do, can the layman, you know, that doesn't know anything about Bitcoin, read your book and go, yeah, well, same old, same old, here they go. But the legacy is that there is this technology that is freedom you know, minded and oriented towards people to be able to live in a world of abundance. And it's going to include this kind of technology. But your benefit of you doing this now when things are, man, here it comes, you know, the, the, the zombie apocalypse or whatever the hell is going on. But it's going to be decentralization down to the individual that's going to be the salvation, which is people like, you know, like Russell Brand. I go, you watch. He's been talking decentralized. He's going to shoot up, and they're going to shoot him down. I guarantee it because what he's advocating, what we've been advocating, what all of us are advocating, decentralization of authority down to the individual is the threat. And cryptocurrency is one of the mechanisms for doing that. This is... 
what's your prediction, you know, that your book is going to play into this awareness? You know, is it a threat to they, them, those? Because I could see when we had it scheduled for you to come on Friday, we were supposed to do this originally a few days ago, everyone, Microsoft and Linux, Linux, it all updated and wiped out, you know, all of, we had to redo our OBS and profile and all. We've been working on it the weekend to get ready for this interview. And I've had this kind of stuff happen before. And it's always about this kind of thing. It's the decentralization down to the individual and freedom opportunity of oriented of Roger Veer having to set hours at customs. Well, this is what happens. So you have in the book now coming out, what role does it play in going into the future? Is it information? Yeah. What, 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 what does it play? The, the book is fantastic for someone, even if they've never used Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency ever, they'll still find the book interesting and informative and they'll be able to you know, pick it up and be able to understand everything. And uh, it was really bizarre how much trouble we had even finding a publisher that was willing to publish it. And then the moment we got it published, Boom, instantly to the very top, you know, bestseller on Amazon already on pre-order. It's not even on sale yet. It's only on pre-order. And it's already, you know, bestseller on Amazon there. Um, but really, really was uh, bizarre just how much pushback there was on some of that. So, uh, but yeah, the book, if you're, you know, hardcore, been in crypto for more than a decade, you'll find the book super informative and learn new things. And if you're someone who's brand new to crypto and doesn't know anything about it, you'll still find it very interesting and informative as well. So the, the book, just like Bitcoin Cash is for everybody. Uh, the Bitcoin uh, hijacking Bitcoin book is for everybody as well. So uh, please go and uh, give it a read and you'll really uh, see the whole crypto universe much more clearly after having uh, absorbed the information in that book. Well, you have with uh, uh, Steve Patterson, what, what was he in it for to, you know, your grammar and spelling? I mean, you know, uh, what kind of role did he have? He was right there side by side with uh, living through the entire thing. And, and him and his whole team did a bunch of the research for the book. So we had all the citations in place. So like nobody can pick up this book and say, oh, this is a pack of lies because every single claim we have in the book uh, is cited right there with, uh, you know, you can look it up for yourself and, and check our work. It's all right there. And uh, we, we, we welcome the, the debate and the open discussion, unlike the, the small blockers that hijacked Bitcoin that did everything they could to censor everything every step of the way. Do you think there's going to be a debate? They've already started attacking the book and trying to like, you know, they, they haven't even read it yet, right? It's not even out yet, and they're already attacking it. So that just shows Roger. Uh, the mentality of the book. So, Roger did it. <laughs> yeah, so go and read the book they don't want you to read. HijackingBitcoin.com. Guarantee they don't want you to read it. Guarantee you that. I guarantee freaking tea. We've been through this over the years, and it was of all the, you know, it started, we had Libertarian Party, Arizona Libertarian newspapers. We had Citizens Taking Initiative, CTI. We had Freedom of Speech. All these newspapers, periodically throughout the 90s, we kept republishing a story. And I don't know if you remember it or have seen it, but it was called From Crossbows to Cryptography. Do you remember that? I, was, I think I may have missed that one. Satoshi, Nak the Nakamoto Institute has it up. When I interviewed those guys, they knew of it. It was, it was like a November 87, 88. And the point of the article was that, of course, the king is going to be against cryptography for the same reasons they were against the crossbow, because the peasants could just uh, pick I it up. I have read this article. Yeah. You know, so that that was our first kind of understanding of cryptography being a decentralization down to the individual of privacy and the spending money, why we were you know so excited about e-gold, so we could see the digital money spending coming. When Bitcoin technology, blockchain technology hit in 09 or something like that, I remember when that started right after the Levolution, the first 08 campaign with Dr. Paul, there was a lot of people that understood or had read this article before or understood, as Roger did, what was coming and why it was so important. This had been going on for decades before it actually happened. A lot of us in the freedom community knew this was essential technology to free individuals from the central plan of they, them, those. You'll own nothing, and here's your happy shot. I mean, this is what's coming. So the battle is on right, not later. This is it. They'll distract you with wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and famine and death and taxes, whatever, all that kind of stuff. But what is feared the most 
is the philosophy that Roger Veer has been advocating and using as a justification for all the decisions about crypto uh, currencies. And this, for him to have experienced it and been on the front lines in debating the biggest, baddest, wanting to make fun of Roger from the whole time, and he got his chest out and not bending an inch, understanding what this was about, then he writes the book, Hijacking Bitcoin, and I guarantee, I haven't read it yet, Go get it, though. You know, that, that hijacking Bitcoin, because it's going to be interesting to me because we lived through it. And there's a whole bunch of behind the scenes. Roger knows way more than I would imagine is going to be in there. From the technology in the book, hijacking Bitcoin, about, you know, the, the, the techno reasons of this and the tech of the tech, how much of it is philosophical? How much is it is outing these people for what they are? I, that is definitely covered, right? And why would people want to do this sort of thing? But uh, if you read the book, you'll have the full story. And uh, I, I hate to call it uh, in for tonight, though, or anybody. Uh, it's it's past my bedtime. But yeah, thank no, you so right. much. We're and wrapping maybe it up, I, man. I, I come back on again with you. Thank you very much. This is for staying up. You know, I get up early. You stay up late. We get done. This is the commitment Roger has. Roger Veer, hijackingbitcoin.com. Go order it right now. If you read this book, I guarantee you're going to see one of the main, if not the main hub of control that they, them, those have to get control of because this is freeing technology. And when you find out, Roger, any other freeing technology you get behind, let me know, would you please? <laughs> you, you got it. Thank you so much, Ernie. Peace, brother. This has been awesome. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Roger Veer, hijackingbitcoin.com. Oh, yeah. Your smile.